It was Monday, May 4th. We were working the day watch out of Juvenile Division. The boss is Captain Morris. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We checked in for work at 8 a.m. By 8.05, Bill looked ready to check out. Hard night? No easy night. It's gonna be a hard day, though. I didn't know you drank. Well, I'm not an alcoholic, Joe. I had two martinis before dinner, that's all. I guess I'm not as young as I used to be. You and Eileen go out last night, did you? Over to her sister's. Charlie, my brother-in-law, added a den to his house, so, of course, we had to go over and look at it. Nice den? You've seen one, you've seen them all. Sure wasn't worth the price. Cost him a lot to build, huh? I'm not talking about what it cost him. I'm talking about what it cost me. Juvenile Friday. Where? What's that address on Cooley? Yes, ma'am, that's right. No, don't touch a thing. Yes, ma'am. We'll be right out. Over on East Cooley in a trash can. Yeah? A four-day-old baby girl. Uh... 9.40 a.m. We arrived at the alley behind 3360 East Cooley. You the police? Yes, ma'am. There's the baby, right there. <coughs> Rudy here found her. I called you right away. Isn't this just dreadful? Yes, ma'am. We knew we shouldn't move it until you arrived. Imagine that. It's a little girl. Can't be over four or five days old. Better get an ambulance out here and fast. Who in the world would do such a dreadful thing? It's absolutely inhuman. You found the baby, did you? Yes, sir. I was cleaning up the backyard here, and I heard the crying. I thought at first it was a cat. You know, I don't believe what I see. No baby belongs in a barrel with trash. It's a sin against yours to throw a baby away like old leaves. What kind of mother could do this terrible thing? Ambulance is on the way. Do you have any idea who left the baby here? I do not. This is a high-grade neighborhood. Yes, ma'am, I understand that. But did you see anybody in the area, any strangers? No. Someone must have driven through our alley and put her in that trash can. What kind of a monster would do such a dreadful thing? Will you be able to find them, whoever did this? We're going to try. I hope the scum are made to suffer for this. They must be suffering much already to do such a thing. Ten fifteen a.m. We followed the ambulance to the Los Angeles County Hospital. All the time I've been on the job, I thought I'd seen it all. A baby in a trash can. Doctor, what's the condition of the child? It looks bad, Joe, real bad. The infant's no more than three or four days old. Now, fortunately, last night was relatively warm. A little four-day-old girl just isn't built to spend all night in a garbage can. Is she gonna live? I'd say maybe, Bill, but that'd be too encouraging. I better get back to We'd like that blanket, Doc. Send it right out, you. Thank you. We can drop the blanket off at SID on our way back to that apartment house. You know, when you think of all the people who'd give everything they've got to have a baby like that, and some poor excuse for a human being throws it away in a trash can. Thank you very much. Gray. Who ever heard of a gray baby blanket? Supposed to be pink for a little girl. Who ever heard of a pink shroud? After emergency treatment, the child would be placed in the intensive care section of the hospital. 10.45 a.m., we dropped the baby's blanket off at Scientific Investigation Division. Then we drove back to 3360 East Cooley to talk with the manager, Sylvia Crystal. How's that baby? We won't know for a while, Mrs. Crystal. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, certainly. Have you any idea at all who might have abandoned that baby? Oh, like I told you before, no idea in the world. I just can't imagine anyone doing such a thing. How about one of your tenants? Could any oh, of them... Oh, no, no, officer, not my tenants. I'll bet anything it happened the way I told you before. Somebody driving through that alley. That's a possibility, Mrs. Crystal, but as a rule, people don't go too far from home when they abandon a child. You mean things like this happen frequently? Yes, ma'am, more frequently than we'd like. When they make up their minds to do a thing like this, they generally pick the closest and nearest place. Now, since the baby was left in your service area, your apartment house is the natural place to begin, isn't it? I see your point. Well, of course, you're welcome to speak to all my tenants, but most of them are at work now. And frankly, Sergeant Friday, most of them are a little too old to be new parents. How about your younger tenants? Mm, the only younger people we have in the building are the Conways and 2C. They have a child. And then we have a couple of girls sharing 2A, Patty Lazar and Christine White. Now, Patty's a secretary and Christine's a nurse. 
They only moved in last month. Both are nice, quiet girls. And then there's Donna Halpern in 1E. She moved in last week. I believe she's a librarian. Her fiancé is in Vietnam. She showed me his picture. All right. Thank you very much, Miss Crystal. Tell me, do you always manage to find the parents in these cases? Usually. And when you do, are they sorry for what they've done? Sometimes. Sometimes they're only sorry that we found them. To see the Conways. Hey, Mrs. Conway? Yes? We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. What's wrong? A baby was found abandoned in the alley down back. We were just checking to see if you have any idea who might have left it. How old was it? Three, four days. Gee, that's awful. Do you know any young women in the neighborhood who were expecting? Gee, no. Is the baby dead? Not quite. It's terrible. I know some of the young mothers in the neighborhood. I see them in the park, you know, when I take Howard, my six-year-old, out for a stroll. But I can't help you. Molly Blaine's pregnant, but she only found out last week. It'll be her fourth. I see. Who are you guys? They're policemen, Howard. No, they ain't. Aren't? Yes, they are. And if you don't behave, they'll arrest you and put you in jail. Oh, no, they won't. They ain't policemen, neither. Well, thank you very much, Miss Conway. Well, sorry I couldn't help. I'm the policeman around here, and if they don't behave themselves, I'm going to stick them in the slammer and turn the key. Well, sorry to trouble you, Mrs. Conway. Not at all. Goodbye, Howard. Go melt, Shorty. Shorty, I'd like to shorty him where he sits down. Two-way, Patty Lazar and Christine White. There's nobody home. Well, the next one's downstairs. Boy, that Howard's really something, isn't he? Oh, forget it. It was only water. With a kid like that, how can you be sure? Donna Halpern, why? Yes? Are you Donna Halpern? Yes, I am. We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. About what? An abandoned baby. It was found in the alley behind your building this morning. We were wondering if you might have some idea who the parents are. No, I haven't any idea. We understand you only moved in last week. Are you from the area? Yes, I was living with my parents. They live over on Evanview, just a few blocks away. But now that I'm working, I decide to get a place of my own. This is just temporary. My fiancé, Tony, is in Vietnam. When he gets back, we'll be getting married and buying a home. Then you don't have any idea who that baby belongs to? No, I don't. Sorry. Well, thank you very much, Miss Halpern. The baby. Was it a boy or girl? It was a little girl. How old would you say it was? Three, four days. That's a shame. Is it all right? Well, she was still alive an hour and a half ago. Well, I sure hope you find who you're looking for. We will. What will happen to the child? I mean, if she lives. She'll be made a ward of the court and placed in a foster home with parents who will let her sleep in a crib, not a trash can. Well, that's the important thing, isn't it? Ma'am. That things turn out well for the baby. I mean, even if, God forbid, the baby dies, it's better this way, isn't it? This way. In a hospital, I mean. It would be terrible to die in a trash can. I can think of something worse. Yes? Being four days old and only having those two alternatives. <laughs> One thirty-five p.m., we canvassed the neighborhood for any information on the abandoned baby. No one seemed to have any idea who the parents of the child might be. One of the residents suggested we might try the Colonial Soda Shop. It was a gathering place for the young people who lived in the neighborhood, including students from the local high school. 3.15 p.m., we drove over to the Colonial Soda Shop. We asked several of the young people, but they could tell us nothing about the abandoned baby. Well, what do you think? I don't know. Maybe that crystal woman was right. Maybe someone did drive through the alley and drop the baby. Sir? Yes, miss? I didn't want to say anything in front of the kids. We understand. It seems so catty. You'll think I'm terrible. Maybe I shouldn't say anything. What's your name? Lisa Bogart. If you have any information at all on that abandoned baby, we want you to tell us. You won't tell her now, will you? What's her name? Sissy Tucker. I'm probably wrong, but Sissy's been out of school for over a week. Sissy Tucker. Well, she's... Well, she dates a lot, goes out with a lot of the guys. Some of the fellas say things about her. You know what I mean. You think I'm terrible, don't you? I mean, to be informing on her. No, miss, you did the right thing. Now, do you know where this Tucker girl lives? Come on, now. You've told us this much. Tell us where she lives. I feel like a rat. You won't if we find the mother of that abandoned baby, now, will you? No, I guess not. 
She lives at 2714 Leitner Avenue. All right, thank you very much, Miss Bogart. One more thing. Maybe you can understand why I feel so bad about this. What's that? She's my best friend. p.m. Bill and I drove over to 2714 Leitner Avenue to talk to the girl by the name of Sissy Tucker. Yes? We're police officers. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, is it about that ticket I got last week? No, ma'am. Does a girl by the name of Sissy Tucker live here? Yes, I'm her mother. We understand she's been absent from school recently. Is that a crime? No, ma'am. We were just wondering why. What do you mean you were just wondering why? child misses a week of school and they send the police out to check on her? Is that really all you have to do with your time? Don't you go out and catch criminals? Sissy is no criminal. We're not truant officers, Mrs. Tucker. A young baby was abandoned in this neighborhood last night and we thought maybe your daughter might help us locate who the child belongs to. You decided my Sissy is an unwed mother. I have a good mind to sue you. Now, we didn't say that, Mrs. Tucker. Well, you heard what I said. The right of you got to come around here and cast aspersions on my daughter. We're not casting any aspersions. We'd like to locate the parents of that baby. You find some little brat and right off you decide my sissy's its mother. If that's not casting aspersions, I'd like to know what it is. We understand your daughter has been absent from school for over a week. We have a four-day-old infant on our hands who might be dead by now. We want to know who, we want to know why. If your feelings have been hurt, we're sorry. If your daughter's reputation has been stained, we apologize. But that doesn't change the fact that we have to check it out. Now, if somebody tells us your daughter might know something that would be helpful to us, we have to run it down. That's why we're here, Mrs. Tucker. Well, she's been in bed with the Hong Kong flu. She's at the Good Mercy Hospital. You can call over there and you can check on that, and that's the truth. What else do they say about Sissy? We understand she sees quite a few boys. That's true. She likes the boys, and the boys like her. She's a little wild, but she's not a bad girl. Her father and I are divorced, and that hasn't been easy for her. She's not a bad girl, though. And one other thing. What's that, Miss Tucker? Sissy would never get pregnant. You're sure of that, are you? I ought to know. She's been on the pill for two years. Four fifteen p.m. We drove back to the PAB and went upstairs to the crime lab to check with Don Hale on the blanket the abandoned baby was wrapped in. Don, did you turn anything on that blanket? No, not a whole lot. Nothing unusual about it. Just a common gray blanket. You can buy them almost anywhere. It's old and it's worn. And that's it, huh? Mm, no, not quite. Metal tag here, no number on it. The face is worn off, as you can see. The blanket's been dry cleaned or it's been laundered? I wish I could tell you which or where. We knew it wasn't much, but it was worth a try. We checked all the laundries and cleaning establishments in the immediate area where the baby had been abandoned. We struck out. The last place on the list was Patterson's Dry Cleaning Emporium, 3754 Vanessa Lane, three blocks from where the abandoned baby had been found. 4.40 p.m. It was a long shot at best. Mr. Patterson? Yes, sir. Police officers. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? You use this kind of metal tag? Yes, we do. What's the trouble? Oh, I can see the trouble. There's no face on it. There's no number on it either, is there? No, sir. Do you recognize the blanket? It's gray. And it could use a good cleaning. Have you ever seen it before? No way I could tell you that. Some things a fellow remembers who belongs to what. Like certain kind of drapes with flowers on them. Like a special kind of afghan, maybe. Like a college blanket with a name on it. Like a mini skirt. Those things a man might remember, but this blanket, I don't remember it. I see. Is it important? That's a dumb question. If it weren't important, you wouldn't be here. That's right, sir. It looks just like a hundred other blankets that come through here every week. What's it all about? Can you tell me? A <laughs> dumb question. Of course you can't tell me. It's a police matter, right? Yes, sir. Well, I tell you how I feel about you policemen. You're a hard-working bunch, day and night, night and day. And whatever it is you're looking for with this blanket, I wish you all the luck to find it. Well, thank you very much, sir. For what? For nothing. You got a tough case on your hands? A <laughs> dumb question. Of course you got a tough case, right? Right. <laughs> Four forty five PM. We'd reached a dead end. The one lead we had faded when the cleaner couldn't come up with an identification on the blanket. We figured the only thing left to do was to double back over the course. 
we drove over to the Colonial Soda Shop to give it another try. Police officers, we'd like to ask you a few questions. Sure. We're looking for a girl who had a baby in the last few days. Now, do you know such a girl and where we might locate her? What do you want her for? Routine investigation. Did she do something wrong? We'd like to talk to her. Do you know a girl like that? Yeah, I might. You might or you do? I don't know exactly. What does that mean? It means what it says. I don't know exactly. Some place where we could talk privately. Room in the back. Let's use it. What's your name? Paul Sutherland. How old are you? 18. All right, now, Paul, you were doing a lot of talking out there, but you weren't saying anything. Well, what do you think the rest of that bunch out there is going to think of me now? You bringing me back in here and all. They're not going to think anything if this is as far as we take you now, are they? Well, you got a point there. Now, you make a couple with us, son. If you know anything about the girl that we're asking about, suppose you tell us. It's important. Well, I don't want to get anybody into trouble. Look, Paul, we got a little four-day-old baby who was abandoned. We want to find out who she belongs to, and if you can help us, we'd appreciate it. Now, do you know a girl who had a baby recently? Well, say I do. What then? You give us her name or address, then you go back and finish your ice cream. Well, you know what you're doing? You're making me think. You haven't got the right to do that. It's not right what you're trying to make me do here. You go indie and wrestle your conscience on your own time, Paul. Right now, we need a name, and we need it quick. You know it. Now you spell it for us. All right, son, you write your own ticket. We can talk here or down at Juvenile. OK. Well, I can't tell you much, just what I know. I had a buddy. He's in the Army now. Before he shipped off, he told me he had made this girl pregnant. He told me he was glad he was going over to Vietnam because he didn't want to be around when the baby came. And that was six, seven months ago he went over. You know the girl's name? I never met her. Tony was a year ahead of me in high school. She was in his class. All he ever called her was Fat Donna. Thanks, Paul. You've given us a lot of help. That may be, but I want to tell you this. What's that? I'll never forgive you for making me think on a friend. Now, what do you think of that? Oh, we'll survive. 5.35 p.m. We return to Donna Halpern's apartment. Oh, hello. May we come in? Certainly. Sit down if you like. I don't know why you came back. I told you everything I knew before. Are you sure about that, Miss Halpern? I am. We're going to advise you of your constitutional rights. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Do you understand that? Yes, but I don't understand why you read all that stuff to me. Did you give birth to a baby girl four days ago? What? Did you deposit that little girl in a trash can last night? What are you saying? I'm saying that a kid named Tony had bragged a friend several months ago that he'd gotten a girl named Donna pregnant. He went to Vietnam. She had his baby. She doesn't have it anymore. Now, how would you add that up? He told me that he wanted to marry me. That's what he said. We were engaged. He said he liked me. Even when I got pregnant, Tony said he was happy about it. He said we get married as soon as he got back. He even wrote me letters from Vietnam saying how much he loved me and missed me. I was happy having his baby. That way he'd have a family waiting for him when he got home. Then last week, I got a letter from him. It's all over, he said. He was getting married to an Oriental girl. Getting married to somebody else. Two days after his letter arrived, I had his child in the bathroom. I delivered it myself. I kept it there for three days. I thought I learned to love it. But every time I looked at it, it reminded me of Tony, that he was married to somebody else. The baby looked exactly like him. I couldn't stand it. She had his eyes, his nose. Nobody knew I was pregnant. I'm so heavy that it didn't show. And the baby was so quiet. It never cried. Even the neighbors next door didn't know about her. Last night, I, I took her out and put her in the trash can. You wanted to kill her? No. I just didn't care. I just couldn't stand to look at her anymore, that's all. I just couldn't help hating her. 
I burned all of Tony's letters and I threw his baby in the trash. That way I was free of him. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing else I could do. You can see that, can't you? No, lady, we can't see it. You're under arrest. What'll happen to me? Well, that's up to the court. You don't think very much of me, do you? Let me put it this way. You'll never make mother of the year, lady. At 48 p.m., on our way downtown to book the suspect, Donna Halpern, we stopped off at the county hospital to check on her baby's condition. Joe. Bill? How's the baby? Well, either I'm a great doctor, which I'm not, or there's a god. Child's gonna live. You're right twice, Doc. She's weak, but she'll make it. You're the mother, are you? Like to see your baby? I already did once. Does she have a name? Call her whatever you like. She's all yours. You really have a low opinion of me, don't you? Does it matter? You don't think I'm worth much, do you? Isn't that your opinion? My opinion and 12 cents will buy you a cup of coffee. Tell me what you think. I don't think, lady. No, I want to know. What's your opinion? You probably think I should go to the gas chamber, don't you? The little brat is still alive and kicking. So what's the big crime? Come on, you're a big, strong policeman. You tell me, what's the crime? Let's you and me level with each other, lady. You want a soft answer to a hard question. Now, you fight that up with yourself, but I'll give you this much. You got yourself pregnant, strung along by the guy, and then he dropped you. Now, maybe you should have known better, but a lot of women older than you have wound up in the same bind. That's exactly right. It was all Tony's fault. Maybe, until four days ago. Then you became responsible for a human life, but you had a choice. That's more than your baby had. Nobody asked her who she wanted for parents. Now, maybe that boyfriend of yours is a two-timing punk, but that baby needed you far more than you needed him. And how did you answer her need? You used your choice. You took a human being, your own little girl, and you threw her out like a bag of garbage. What's going to happen to me? That's up to the court and your conscience. Or did you throw that away, too, while you were at it? The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 6th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of violating Section 273... 81 of the American Legion. It was almost over. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. three guests and to say that I'm glad so many of you were able to be with us this morning and now I'll call on the chaplain of the Los Angeles Police Department for the benediction Sergeant William Riddle will you all please rise shall we pray our Heavenly Father we thank you this morning for one of life's great prizes the chance to work hard at a work worth doing we thank you for the words law, justice, freedom, and the opportunity we in this room have to protect their meaning. Lord, the psalmist has said, through God we shall do valiantly. We ask that this might be true in our day-to-day -day battle against crime. Dismiss us with thy blessing. Amen. 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 The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Yeah. See, I told you you'd enjoy yourself. It was fine. You ought to come to more of these, Joe. Well, I'm not a member of the Legion. Too bad, but you can come as my guest as often as you like. How often do they have this breakfast? Once a year. You know, there's one thing I didn't know. What's that? I didn't know the department had a chaplain. You didn't? No. 
Why? Well, I just didn't know, that's all. How long has he been with us? Six, seven years now. I'm surprised you didn't know, Joe. What else does he do on the job? Joe, he's the chaplain. He doesn't have to do anything else. What else would you expect him to do? I don't know. I just wondered, that's all. Well, it's like I've always said. What's that? Joe, you're a heathen. a.m. Bill and I returned to the office. Captain Nelson wanted to see us. How are you doing on the Westerville book? Looks like we got the back office pinned down, but we don't have probable cause for a search warrant yet. All right. Maybe North Hollywood's found some daylight for us. Yeah? What do they got, Skipper? 318 out in the valley. Domino Bar and Grill. Looks like the bartender's taking the action. Name's Richard Klinger. No previous record. Westerfeld's been seen in the joint. Seems pretty friendly with Klinger. You figure operating the location? That's right. But you'll have to sit this one out, Gannon. You worked North Hollywood too long. Pretty good chance you'll be burned. You continue on the Westerfeld surveillances. See if you can find a tie between him and that back office clerk. Yes, sir. Who's working it out in North Hollywood? Yes. Send him in. Friday, the man you'll be operating with is here now. Friday and Gannon, Sergeant Bill Riddle, North Hollywood Vice. Riddle's all I see out there. Come on in, Sergeant. Thought you gave a real nice benediction this morning, Chaplain. Thanks. One thing I want to make clear, Riddle's had his share of vice experience. When he's not in those dress blues, he's a policeman like the rest of us. He's made his share of cases the same as any other man in the department. Well, maybe there's one slight difference. What's that? The only time I drink is on the job. a.m. Riddle, Gannon, and I met in the squad room to work out plans for operating the Domino Bar and Grill. Sure never figured it, Chaplain. What's that, Gannon? Well, I mean, it's kind of unusual, isn't it? Maybe, but it's what I want to do. Is that right? Yeah, before we moved out here, I had my own church in upstate New York. If you really think about it, there's a certain affinity between preaching the Word of God and being a policeman. They're both on the side of right. Makes sense. What kind of cover will work best for you? While I was studying theology, I worked my way through as a part-time surveyor. That's what they know me as in the bar. Well, it leaves me out. I don't know anything about surveying. You don't have to. I got enough to carry us through. You can be the chain man, you know, the guy that holds the rod and helps me measure while I look through the transit. Sounds reasonable. Khaki pants, cloth jacket. That's the idea. I'm pretty well accepted in this joint. They know me as Bill Radford. But they're still too hinky to take any of my action. What surveying outfit do we work for? I'm an independent contractor. You work with me. All right. Now, it's an off day for Santa Anita. First post for the Eastern tracks is around 10 our time. There's not much local action. What do you say we throw him a curve and start operating tonight? Fine. You know, Chaplain, no matter how you slice it... What's that? This has got to do, Joe, a world of good. 9. Monday, January 9th, 5.30 p.m. Bill Riddle and I checked out an unmarked station wagon from the carpool, and we drove out to the San Fernando Valley. The Domino Bar and Grill was located in the 2000 block on Lancashire Boulevard. Riddle was known in the place and considered almost a regular... He pointed out the waitress, Angie. He said she was friendly. Riddle was on a first-name basis with Richard Klinger, the bartender. Hiya, Bill. Ryan Water? Fine. Angie, I'd like you to meet a buddy of mine, Joe Fraser. Angie. Boy, Angie. Huh. Haven't seen you around for a couple of days. Where you been hiding? Oh, I finally picked me up a chain man, Joe here. Oh, good deal. What do you have, Joe? Beer's fine. Why don't we sit at the bar? Bath breeze with Dick. Suits me. What did you say, Bill? You got me a chain man. I'm back in business. So as she tells me. Glad to hear it. One draft, one right. Keep it. Buy a mink coat. Who's he, J.P. Morgan? No, but he got his unemployment check today. Well, I'll just pick up a stove. It's too hot in California for a coat. You do that. Kind of slow, huh? It's a little early yet. We do pretty good late business. Is that so? You know, I've been thinking about getting a piano player, but it's pretty rough to get a permit this time. Oh, Dick, say hello to Joe Frazier, a guy I work with. Glad to know you, Joe. Same here. So you finally got an assistant in that surveying job, huh? Yep. I'm happy to hear it. I hated to see all that smart going to waste. Yeah, a little tough to get in gear when you're from out of state. I know what you mean. L.A.'s not the easiest place to start shaking hands quick. Yeah, this is nowhere city as far as I'm concerned. Is that so? Yeah, they leave the sidewalks out all night here. They roll up the town. Where are you from? Right here, born and raised. Been the same since I can remember. Cops keep the lid nailed down, no action, no nothing. Oh, I haven't been here as long as Joe, but I gotta go on. L.A. stands for low on action. Angie's single. 
checks out at 2 a.m. Well, now, that's nice to know, but that's not what I had in mind. I'm talking about a little tax-free circus money. You got to drive all the way down to Caliente or out to Santa Anita. Yeah? I like to have a little something going every day. Maybe nothing big, but a little daily recreation don't hurt anybody. You say you're a native here? That's right. Well, then you ought to know. Yeah. It's against the law. Thursday, January 12th. Three days went by. We were certain Klinger was taking action, but he wasn't taking any from us. 3.30 p.m. Bill picked us up in Unit 1K80. We cruised the far side of the valley while we talked. We've been living with Westerfeld. So far, nothing. Yeah? We get him up in the morning, put him to bed at night. So far, it's the same routine. Hasn't been near that back office. And the clerk acts like a hermit. Stops at a different liquor store every night. They all sell scratch sheets, but we haven't seen him buy one. Mm-hmm. It was the back office, and that's it. Well, sooner or later, Westerfeld's got to shake hands with his clerk. We'll stay with it. How are you two doing? Nothing so far, but Joe has a thought. Yeah? It's a waitress in there. Name's Angie. She must know what's going on. Maybe she'll share it with us. How do you figure to work it? Well, tonight, Riddle and I will hang around till closing. Maybe I can buy our breakfast. I'll fill the skipper in. Keep in touch. All right. Have a good breakfast, Joe. Riddle and I returned to the Domino Bar and Grill. We sat in a booth until almost closing time, 1.37 a.m. Last call. I'm fine. Angie? Yes? You got any plans when you get off tonight? Why? Well, I could take you to the Coconut Grove, but they'll be closed, too. Well, then. How about some breakfast? Never before noon. You know, you ought to take him up on it, Angie. Joe's a nice, round-headed single boy. Thanks anyway, Bill. But you can see Angie and I just aren't star-crossed. Whatever that means. Sure you don't want another? No, thanks. Doesn't look too promising. No, I don't know. I still got 15 minutes before closing. I'll leave you the wagon. Good luck. Right. See you tomorrow, Bill. I beg your pardon, sir. May I join your party? I'm not having any party, fella. Do you mind if I sit down? I'm a little road weary. When the rest of your gang gets back, I will move over. Okay? You're carrying quite a load, aren't you? How do you mean, sir? You've had a little too much to drink. Oh, no, sir, I have not. I may have had one or two... But I know my capacity. I do not get drink. Now, may I buy you a little drunk? No, and I don't think you can have one either. Last call's over. Last call? Why don't you let me call you a cab? I have one cab, sir. Well, don't you think you ought to climb in it and head for home? Sir, I would just like to have a little toast with your party. I will buy a round of friends for all of your drinks. I told you, there's no party here and the bar is closed. With that dirty little Ernie. What's that? Ernie, that dirty little Ernie, he lied to me again. He told me the checker bar was open till all night. Well, this is the Domino Bar. The Domino Bar? Oh, that dirty little Ernie, he didn't even tell me they changed the name of this place. Here, drink this, it'll make you feel better. What is that? What do you like in your coffee? Hot. No, I mean cream, sugar. Sugar? Yeah, well, sugar turns to alcohol. It gets you all ground up inside, isn't it? No, but, but thank you for hospitality. Deedle do deedle dum. Is she the owner? Don't you think you better drink that, mister? The name is Simmons. Remember the name. Jay Simmons. I am from Pismo Beach, sir. Well, you're a long way from home, aren't you? That's about 100 miles up north. Well, I have been trying to get to Los Angeles for five months now to, to say hello to the old gang down here, sir. You drink that, and I'll help you into your cab. You know, I don't drink and drive, sir. Inca Hall and gasoline do not mix. That's right. That's right. I love clam chowder. Is that so? I kept looking all over for Pismo Beach. 
just to get a bowl of clam chowder. I found it. I have moved my home to Pismo Beach. I love clams. You Navy? Navy. All right, Lyle. Don't you think it's about time you headed for home? Angie, would you mind locking up for me tonight? Shirley's sick. Not at all, Dick. Hope she feels better. Thanks. Come on, fellow. I'll get you a cab. I have one cab, sir. I wish to go back to Pismo Beach. Would you get me a cab which knows which way it is to Pismo and tell it I'll drive? You're not going to do any driving. I certainly am. I'm too drunk to walk. Come on, let's go. Let you and I go out the front. We're okay, huh? Diddle dum bum bum ba dee do dee dum bum and doom curfew time. Dolly dilly dum dum. End of the night, Joe. Yeah, it kind of looks that way. How about a cigarette? Got to lock up? Yeah, I know. There's no law against smoking after 2 a.m., is there? No, I guess not. Who's Shirley? Who? I heard Claire say that Shirley was sick. Oh, you'll have to excuse me. I'm tired. Shirley, that's Dick's daughter. She's 10. What's the matter with her? Something to do with her heart. I don't know exactly. A murmur, something like that. Dick's a widower, you know. Is that so? Seems like a nice guy. He is. How long you been working for him, Angie? Oh, he doesn't own the place. Somebody by the name of Burroughs up north. I was hired by them in San Francisco. Told them I wanted to come south, and they put me in here. Close to three years now. You must know Klinger pretty well. Not that well, but he's been a good friend. That's all I meant. Sure. What is it, Angie? You don't think much of me, do you? Never bothered to rage you. Why? All men are alike and all that? I guess. You meet all kinds hustling drinks in a bar. I imagine you do. I say you meet them all, but they're all alike. Not all. You're different? It's possible. But not probable. You rate Klinger pretty high. Why shouldn't I? He's straight, he's good, and he's honest. That about covers it. You have that tone in your voice like you think he's not. Well, you'd know more about that than I would. I just met him. Dick's a good man. Takes care of his little girl. No wife to help him. He worships that child. He's good. If you say so. I say so. Good night, Joe. Tuesday, January 24th, 11.35 a.m. Riddle and I met again with Bill Gannon. You do any good, Gannon? Like the Pilgrims, we're making a little progress. What do you got? Spider Westerfeld and his back office clerk and a meet. They exchange sheets. We've gone as far as we can go. The rest is up to you. Yeah, all we need is that phone number. Tuesday, January 24th, 12.30 p.m. We hoped that somehow we could persuade Dick Klinger to give us the number of the phone spot, which would give us the probable cause to have a search warrant issued against Westerfield's bookmaking operation. It didn't look too encouraging. Uh, how's it going, Dick? Not so hot, my little girl's sick again. Is it so? What's the matter with her? She has a bad heart. A congenital defect of the mitral valve, they call it. She's gonna have to have open heart surgery one of these days. Sorry to hear it. Poor little thing. She's only 10, never complains, never says a word about it. She knows she has a bad heart? Yeah. The doctor said she'd have to be told. She has to take it real easy. No running her plane with the other kids. Operation like that must cost a lot of money. Sure does. And I don't know where it's going to come from. I've got a little saved up, but not nearly enough. I wanted to have a specialist, the best. I don't blame you. It's too bad you don't have another job you could work part-time at. A lot of guys in your line pick up a few extra bucks working days. I've got a little something going on the side. That right? Maybe I played too close to the vest. I don't know. What's that, Dick? Well, a few days ago, you two were talking about finding a little action. Isn't that right? Yeah. You still interested? What do you got in mind? You want to get a little something down, isn't that it? You knew that three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, I didn't know you. Who's taking the action? You're looking at him. What's the setup? I double the line. 30, 12, and 6 in the first $10. Pay up to 100 in the daily double. All right. How do we get it in? The clerk will answer, bottle and bond. You can back 100 proof. Give your identification. You're Joe 1 for Dick. And you're Bill 5 for Dick. You got it? Yeah. Here's the phone number. Wednesday, January 25th, 4.30 p.m. Riddle, Gannon, and I reported to Captain Harry Nelson. 
Klinger told you you'd settle up with him? Yes, sir. Once a week, Monday nights. How much action have you laid in so far? 120 in the past two days. I'm ahead 35, 60, but Riddle's down 50. All right, first thing in the morning, Joe, you and Riddle go over to the DA's office and start the ball rolling on the search warrants. We'll tentatively plan to go Saturday. Usual procedure. Lieutenant Swenson will brief all concerned personnel around 10.30 a.m. Radio communications coordinated through our office with standby crews ready to stiff any suspected phone spots after we serve the warrants on Westerfeld in the back office. Gannon, you serve Westerfeld. Bowser will take the phone spot. Yes, sir. Joe, you and Riddle take the back office. Yes, sir. Go time, 12.15, 15 15 minutes before first post. Saturday, January 28th, 11.47 a.m. We had obtained the search warrants. Riddle and I drove out to the valley. We headed for the apartment house where the back office was located. 12.15 p.m. Flash paper. Stay put, police officer. Search warrant for the premises. You're under arrest. Here are the numbers to the fronts and the codes. While I informed the suspect of his constitutional rights, Riddle called Captain Nelson. He told him that we were in and gave him the codes and numbers for the fronts. We asked that a black and white unit transport the suspect downtown. Saturday, January 28th, 12.48 p.m. Angie, do you mind hanging up my coat for me? Keep it. You'll need it. Police officers, you're under arrest. Conspiracy to commit bookmaking. Oh, no. All right, Clinger, I have to inform you of your constitutional rights. Well, just a minute. I won't run out on you. I'm not going anyplace, but can't you give me a couple of days? My kid's awful sick. Sorry. You have the right to remain silent. And any state it's not as if he murdered somebody. He broke the law. You, you right sound like a cheap dime novel. Do I? Just for making a little book so he could do better for his kid. There are other ways. That little girl of his. You must feel real proud of yourself when you think about her. I wish he had. Saturday, January 28th, 4.38 p.m. Six suspects, including the head man of the bookmaking operation, Gordon Westerfeld, were booked for conspiracy to commit bookmaking. Five of them were released on bail within four hours of their arrest. A quick evaluation of records seized in the back office indicated that the bookmaking operation was handling in excess of $75,000 every week. Identification was found on Klinger bearing the name Ross Clement. A check of R&I revealed that he was wanted in Pennsylvania for forgery. He would be held in the central jail, located in PAB, pending extradition. Wednesday, February 1st, 11.15 a.m. Cream and sugar? Yeah. You just missed it. Central jail called. Klinger wants to talk to you and Riddle. What about? Just said it was urgent. Two p.m. Bill Riddle drove in from North Hollywood. We met with Richard Klinger in one of the interview rooms at the Central Jail. My little girl died an hour ago. Sorry, Klinger. I never told her what the chances were. It, it, it looked good for the first few hours after the operation. She thought she was going to get better. They, they told me she was talking about riding a horse. She loved horses. Then she just just fell asleep and it was all over. We're sorry, Dick. I. I've got to make the arrangement somehow. I don't know who to turn to. I thought I'd ask you. Sure. I'd, I'd sure appreciate it. Tell us what you need. I only got $600. Hospital bills and doctors. It doesn't leave much. It doesn't have to be anything showy, you know. Just something nice. We'll take care of it. You won't need a big coffin. She's a s small girl. She, she never had much chance to grow much. She's got a, a white dress. It's, it's hanging in the closet at home. All right. She's got some favorite things in a little cardboard jewel box. Will you pick out whatever you think would look nice and make sure they fix her hair? But the big problem is, you see, we never went to church. So I, I don't have a minister or anything like that. I understand. Having a, a nice service, that's the important part. Somebody will say the right words. Can you find someone that can do that? We've got somebody.
story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 15th, trial was held in Department 183, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Five of the suspects were found guilty under sections 182.5 and 337A of the California State Penal Code, conspiracy and bookmaking. The four clerks were each fined $250. Detail. The description could fit almost anyone. What's he doing that for? The hold-up man might have touched something, but I told you he didn't. Believe me, I know. I never took my eyes off him. He's getting away while you waste time in here. You ought to be out chasing him, getting my money back. What do you think I'd pay taxes for? I gave you a perfect description. He's five foot nine or ten, grayish black hair, medium build, not fat, not thin. His eyes are brown, his nose is straight, he combs his hair with a part on the side. Now you go out and find a guy just like that. And you'd like us to arrest him when we do? Well, certainly I would. Fred, we've got a problem here. What do you mean by that? Well, that description fits you, too. Sergeant, just came in over the air. Call your office. Right, thanks. Said it was important. A woman named Jean Sawyer had telephoned. She said she knew who the man was that held up the grocery store. 2.30 p.m. She lived in the immediate neighborhood. We drove over to see her. Gene Sawyer? That's me. We're police officers. This is Bill Cannon. Oh, yeah, I've been waiting for you. Come right in. You want to know who held up that grocery store, don't you? Well, I can tell you, and I can tell you where to find him. Two blocks down and two blocks north. Would you give us his name, please? His name is John. J-O-H-N. John what? What do you mean, John what? John Sawyer. He's my husband. Now you're telling us that your husband held up that grocery store. You bet I am, and once you've met the bum, you'll understand why. How's that? He's a bum. He's no good. Wastes his time fixing things. Fools around with a dune buggy. I tell you, I wonder why I ever married that guy. Me, who had a chance at a lawyer once, a doctor another time, men with real money. Well, now, what makes you think your husband held up that store? I don't think it. I know it. I could have told you months ago it had happened. He talked about it? Well, not in so many words, but he did say once he was going to put that store out of business someday. Well, how'd you know it was going to be today? I didn't know it was going to be today. One of my neighbors passed the place just after it happened. As soon as he told me about it, I knew John had done it. Why, well, you can't imagine how glad I am I walked out on that bum last month. He doesn't live here. Are you kidding? I ran out on him bag and baggage. Threw my wedding ring in his face and left that house for good. I was married to that crumb for six years. That's all the trouble anybody should take. Now you go on over there and you look around. You'll find everything he stole in five minutes. I'm afraid we don't have enough probable cause to conduct a search. Well, I told you he did it. He'll say he didn't. We've got to have more than just your word. What do you mean, more? Since when is the word of an honest citizen no better than an ex-con's? He's an ex-convict? He just got out of San Quentin last fall. What did he do time for? Armed robbery. What else? Three forty p.m. John Sawyer lived on North Sycamore Street, five blocks from the grocery store that had been held up. Hi. What can I do for you? You need something fixed, you brought it to the right place. You John Sawyer? That's right. If I can't fix it, nobody can. Police officers, this is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Hey, I'm clean. Ask my P.O. You've been here all day? Yeah, that's right. Never left the place. Can you prove that? Well, why? What's to prove? The grocery store at 4th and Beverly was just knocked over. 4th and Beverly? Sam Golden's? You know the place, do you? Sure do. I hope they hit Sam real good. Why do you say that? Oh, that's a long story. We got the time. That wife of mine sent you, didn't she? Sure she did. How about that? Jean finally kept her word about one thing anyway. How do you mean that? She said she'd nail me. She swore she'd get even. Get even for what? Kicking her out. I showed her the door and told her not to come back. She's a drunk, not an alcoholic, just a plain lush. I didn't mind it before I went to the joint, but after? Well, I tried to stop it. Even asked Sam Golden to quit giving her all that booze on credit. Told him I wouldn't pay the bills. 
She worked for a friend of his, so we knew he'd always get his money. Did you ever say you were going to put him out of business? Jean told you that, too, huh? I put up with her as long as I could, and then I threw her out. She's been passing it around. She'd make trouble for me. And you figure she's doing that now, do you? If she says I pull that stick up, certainly she's doing that. But you got no way of knowing if that's the truth or not. That's right. You don't seem to have an alibi, and you do fit the general description. Well, all right. Search the place. Bring in a whole crew if you want. You can start with the garage out back. All right, we'll do that. Sure, go ahead. Help yourself. I guess it won't mean much, but there ought to be some way I can prove I'm clean. There is. What's that? Come downtown for a show-up. Before we left, we gave Sawyer's entire premises a thorough search. We found nothing that would in any way implicate him in the robbery of the grocery store. October 7th, 11 a.m., John Sawyer was advised of his rights and voluntarily appeared in a show-up. Sam Golden was asked if he recognized anyone in the line as the holdup man. The other men who appeared in the show up were prisoners from Central Jail. Sam Golden was positive that John Sawyer was not the man who held him up. Well, I'm sure glad it cleared the air. Yeah, so are we, and thanks for your cooperation. I can't say I wasn't worried. Yeah, we can understand that. You know, mistakes can happen, and Golden knew me once. He might have thought I looked familiar. We considered that. Well, I sure hope you get the guy that really did it. We're going to try. Well, I guess I better get moving. I got a long list of things to do today. You know, it's right up at the top, don't you? What's that? A short talk with that loving ex-wife of mine. October 13th, 11, 10 a.m. The captain wanted to see us. Tell me about it, Joe. Last week, that grocery store robbery. The week before that, a restaurant. This morning, a supermarket. The M.O. is the same in each case. So is the description. Could fit anybody. You think it's the same man? Yes, sir. That's how we make it, Captain. All right. I'll put two more teams on it. They'll work separately, but you'll coordinate. Yes, sir. Go over the old ground again. Take a second look at everything. Retrace your leads. Right. Next time I open this file, there's one thing I'd like to see on top. Yes, sir. The arrest report. Brown. Yes, right here. It's for you, Friday. Thank you. This Friday... The supermarket. Well, yes, ma'am. If the newscaster gave a description... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, now, you told us the same thing last week, and we... We had no reason to arrest him, Mrs. Sawyer. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll do that. Thank you very much for calling. Mrs. Sawyer again. Heard about the supermarket job on the radio. Claims her husband did it. We checked it out last time. Had a blank wall. Check it out again. This time there might be a door in it. October 13th, 4.40 p.m. John Sawyer agreed to appear in another show-up. The cashier from the supermarket failed to identify him. 10 days went by, October 23rd, 10.40 a.m. A service station had been held up the night before. Bill and I drew the case, and we filled out the reports. Well, what are you going to do about it? Do about what, Mrs. Sawyer? The service station hold up last night. You wouldn't listen to me the last time or the time before that, and now this happens. Now, Mrs. Sawyer, we are you going to let him get away with this one, too? No, ma'am, he hasn't gotten Instead away with Instead of sitting here, you ought to be out there picking him up. We've already picked him up twice, Mrs. Sawyer. And let him go twice, an ex-con. What are you doing? Wait until he holds up everything in the city? He's an ex-con. Go out and get him. Now, having a record doesn't mean a man's guilty, Mrs. Sawyer. Maybe you just can't be bothered. It's too much trouble to arrest him. You'd have too many forms to fill out. Mrs. Sawyer, if you'll just listen a minute. I've heard about cops like you. Collect your pay and do as little as you can. Well, I told you people a dozen times, John pulled those stick-ups. No, ma'am, he didn't. You're lying. We have the man in custody who held up that gas station last night. He was picked up this morning, and we have two good witnesses. Well, what about those other stick-ups, the supermarket and the grocery store? The man we picked up confessed to both of those. I don't believe it. I just can't. Oh, yes, ma'am, you can. You just won't. Give me my paper. October 24th, 2.10 p.m., we received another 2.11 call. A dry cleaning establishment had been held up. Carl Freeman from Leighton Prince arrived soon after we did. He checked the place over while we talked to the clerk. I'm telling you, it was just terrible. I'm going to have nightmares about it. All right, would you start at the beginning and tell us everything you remember? Well, I was just checking some invoices, doing my job, you know, and I had them all mixed up, so I spread them out on the counter. 
Well, I had just started to sort him out when I heard the door open, so I looked up. And what did you see? It was his face. I've never seen anything like it. I didn't know what to do. I just froze. It was awful. Would you describe the man, please? Well, in a way, his face was all mashed in. The nose was pushed flat a little, and the hair, what I could see of it under his hat, was pressed flat. And so were his lips a little. Stocking mask. A what? Probably wore a woman's stocking pulled down over his head. It distorts the features. Could you tell what color his hair was? No, not really. All I could see was that face. Well, you say he wore a hat. What did it look like? Do you remember? No, I don't. I, I didn't really notice. Did he wear a jacket, a windbreaker, or a sweater? It was a jacket. Yes, that's what it was. Just an ordinary jacket. Some dark color, I think. What about his voice? Anything unusual there? He sounded hoarse. I could hardly hear him. It was just a whisper, really. What did he say? Well, nothing at first. Then he pointed the gun at me and said, open the cash register. But I couldn't move. I couldn't even scream. Now, do you remember what kind of a gun he had? Oh, I don't know anything about guns. All right. Did it look like this one? Yes, exactly. Only it was longer. You mean this part, the barrel? Yes, if that's what you call it. 38 blue steel revolver. Oh, it was just awful. But do you know what the worst part was? No, ma'am. What was that? When he started to reach across the counter, I thought he was reaching for me. I remember something. I did notice something. What was that? His right wrist. When he reached across the counter for the money, part of his wrist showed. I, I mean, the sleeve pulled up the way they do, you know. Yes, ma'am. Go on, please. Well, I'm not sure. I don't know what it was. It was a, a mark of some kind. Can you describe it? It was red, sort of. I thought it was blood at first, but it couldn't have been now that I think about it. It was a straight line, or the bottom end of one, about as thick as a pencil, maybe a little thinner. Now, you say it was red. Oh, yes, I'm sure of that. It was red, all right. Could it have been a scar? Oh, no, it looked more like something that was drawn on, paint or something. A tattoo? That's right. It could have been part of a tattoo. Joe? As soon as I print the girl for elimination, I'm all through here. Did you do any good? A couple of good ones, a few partials, some smudges. I'll run the elimination as soon as I get back to the office. Right. Sarge, just came in over the air. You'll call this number right away. Thank you. Let me guess. Gene Sawyer. You called it. Carl, when you run those prints, check them against John Sawyer's, will you? What's that L.A. number? 11805. Will do. Thanks. Well, now, that should satisfy her. Don't you make book on it, pal. <laughs> October 25th, 10 a.m., we had an M.O. check runoff. The report showed a couple of dozen possibilities. As a disguise, a stocking mask was nothing unusual. Robbery homicide, Gannon. You'll recognize the voice. This Friday. Yes, Mrs. Sawyer? Yes, ma'am, we know, but we might not have to pick him up. No, ma'am, we're checking the fingerprints right now. Yes, ma'am, we know he was convicted of our... Miss Sawyer, we... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, we are grateful when a citizen calls... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Now, if he's guilty, we won't let him get away with it. What's that? Yes, ma'am, that's a promise. All right, thank you for calling. Goodbye. You know something, Joe? What's that? I've been keeping track. That's the 11th time she's called in 19 days. Gentlemen. Carl, what do you got? The good prints belong to the girl. Yeah. I got one readable partial. Were you able to make it? Oh, yeah, thanks to Joe's hunch. What do you mean, my hunch? Print belongs to John Sawyer. Sawyer's right index fingerprint. This is the partial print I lifted from the cash register. The ridge characteristics are quite clear. Both prints are ulnar loops. How many points were you able to make, Carl? I'll give you what I've got. Look at this clockwise bifurcation. Notice its location. Now look at the other print. The same kind of clockwise bifurcation is located in the identical place. Point one. Notice this ending ridge now. It compares with a similar ending ridge in this print. Point two. This island matches the island over here. Point three. And this enclosure is identical in shape and location with this one. That's four. Now notice the size and location of this short dot ridge. Then look at this one. Twins. Five. Then there's this anti-clockwise bifurcation over here and a similar one here. That's six. Right, six points. That's all. 
The print's only a partial. For one thing, sure, it tells us Sawyer's our man. That it does, but six points won't prove it in court. No, it still takes ten. 12.20 p.m., we drove over to talk to John Sawyer. Hi. Don't tell me she's at it again. What is it this time, another supermarket? Dry cleaning store. I'm sorry about all this. I told her off real good last time, but I guess it didn't help. Shall I go get my coat? What for? To go downtown for a shot. No, not this time. You wore a mask. That makes it tough. How do you mean? For me to prove I'm clean. You can search the place again if you want. Turn it upside down if that'll prove anything. You know I don't mind. I'll do anything you want. I got nothing to hide, and I want to prove it. I have to. I sure don't want my P.O. to violate me. All right. We'll put it down that way. Thanks. I really appreciate it. What'd you do? Cut yourself there? Huh? Where? Right there on your wrist. Looks like a cut. Oh, that? No, that's just a tattoo. The guy who did it was stoned. He not only put it on backwards, he made the flagpole red. Some job, huh? Sure fools a lot of people. It's really surprising. What's that? How many people notice it? p.m. Like John Sawyer's partial fingerprint, the tattoo on his wrist would not be conclusive enough for the district attorney to file on. We needed something solid. The stolen money, the gun used in the commission of the holdup. At any rate, whether John Sawyer's wife had been right or not, he was now a prime suspect in the latest holdup, the dry cleaning store. Bet you think I'm surprised you're here, but I'm not. You boys like a drink? No, thanks. On duty and all that, huh? Thanks just the same. I knew you'd wise up sooner or later. It's the way you people operate. It's always the same. You waste time going out of your way to overlook the obvious. You ignore anything right in front of you. You gotta come around to it in your own way, in your own time. We'd like to talk to you about your husband. Oh, now you'd like to talk to me. How many times have I told you to lock him up? But would you listen? No, you gotta do your own thing. You gotta go through your own routine. You gotta get all fouled up in miles of red tape. Well, now, most of what you call red tape, Mrs. Sawyer, is to protect your rights. That's what I mean. That's it exactly. You look at both sides of everything so much, you don't know which way is up anymore. Take my case. How many times did I tell you to arrest my husband? A few. Well, did you? No, you did not. We didn't believe he was guilty at that time. Well, you want to arrest him now, don't you? If we find enough evidence. There you go again. I keep telling you he did it, and you keep talking about evidence. You wouldn't believe your own eyes if you saw him stick up that dry cleaner and walk right out with the money in his hand. Now, Mrs. Sawyer, you told us that he owns a dune buggy, is that right? Yeah, he's got a dune buggy, all right. Well, now, when we checked out his garage, it wasn't there. Well, it shouldn't be there. That's not where he keeps it. Where does he keep it? What do you want to know that for? You think he'd be dumb enough to use a dune buggy for his getaway car? That question's too dumb even to answer. Where does he keep the car, Mrs. Sawyer? You mean to tell me you haven't checked on this before? We haven't had any reason to until now. What do you think you're going to find in that place where he stores his dune buggy? Enough evidence to charge him with that cleaning store holdup, maybe. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? I would have told you right off. I want to see that bum in jail where he belongs. He rents an old shed. Where is it located? Near the freeway across town. He keeps his dune buggy there. That way he doesn't have to tow the thing all the way through traffic. He spent more time with that thing than he ever did with me. Exactly where is this shed located? Do you have the address? I don't know offhand. It's in some alley. Well, now, how do we locate it? Follow him. Tomorrow's Sunday. He'll be taking the buggy out to the desert. He'll have to get up early, though. He leaves around 7. Just follow him. He'll lead you right to it. Well, now, wouldn't it be simpler if you just gave us the address? All right. I'll make a deal with you. I'll give it to you if you'll do something for me. And what's that? Just be sure and tell him I sent you. October 26th, 6.30 a.m. We drove over to East Los Angeles where John Sawyer kept his dune buggy. He was already there when we arrived. What are you guys doing here? Just stand still, keep those hands in plain sight. Look, you guys checked me out yesterday. Something new came up. All right, I want you to listen carefully to your rights. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. 
Now, do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Yes, I do. Okay, if we look around? Yeah, sure, but you'll just be wasting your time. We don't mind. It's Sunday. You don't want to waste it like this. You ought to be outside or something in the mountains or in the desert. That's where I'm going. I'm supposed to meet some guys. We have to check this place out first. What for? You're wasting your time. How would you like to save some of it for us? Well, how? There's nothing here you can see for yourself. Must take you quite a while to get enough air in that balloon tire with that old-fashioned tire pump. I just use it for emergencies. You guys got me all wrong. Just because that ex-wife of mine is trying to make me look bad, you're here leaning on me. What is it you want, anyway? The gun you used and the money you stole on that holdup. When are you going to stop believing Gene and believe me? Just as soon as you give us a reason to. Now, you know if we have to, we can take this dune buggy of yours apart piece by piece. Now, without a warrant, you can't. We can get one. You never talked about a warrant before, Sawyer. You wanted us to search your house. Now, have you got something here you didn't have there? Okay, in that spare wheel inside the tire, the gun and the money. You'd have found it anyway. You guys are pretty smart. You spotted the tire pump. Which wheel is it? The outside one. It's all Jean's fault. She's the one you ought to bust. Well, now, how do you figure that? She kept turning in false alarms, didn't she? And you kept checking me out and finding me clean. That's right. Well, that's how I figured. Well, how did you figure? As long as Jean kept calling you, you had to think I was clean this time, too. <laughs> October 26th, 10.30 a.m. John Sawyer signed a confession. We finished filling out the reports. What is the big idea? You locked my man up. That's right, we did. Well, now, you had no business doing that. Let him go. How's that? You heard me. Let him go. He's completely innocent. Mrs. Sawyer, we... He is innocent. He wouldn't pull another stick up, not after going to prison the last time. Not my Johnny. I ought to know. You listen to me. No, ma'am, we listened to you before. Now, you kept saying he was guilty, didn't you? Sure I did, but I didn't mean it. I was just giving him a hard time. He had it coming to him. You had no business believing me. We didn't. Well, forget everything that happened before. Just listen to me now. Johnny's innocent. Let him go. He had the stolen money in his possession. He turned the holdup gun over to us and he signed a full confession. Oh, that big dumb fool. I'd have never told you about that dune buggy. How was I to know he'd really try another stick up? I just wanted him back. He ignored me. I was trying to get him back. I didn't know it'd turn out this way. And it's all your fault that it did. You're to blame for this whole stinking mess. Both of you. Well, how do you figure that, Mrs. Sawyer? Well, you shouldn't have paid any attention to me. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 22nd, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Technology remains a magnet to those seeking worthwhile employment. Sometimes people seek employment outside the law. When they do, I try to stop them. I carry a badge.
appeared that the child had been rendered unconscious by an overdose of narcotics. What's the word, Doc? He's asleep, but not permanently. We pumped his stomach, got his blood pressure stabilized, and respiration is good. Barring the unexpected, he'll make it. What'd the boy drop? Barbs? I'll have to wait for a lab report, but the reaction's all there. I'd say Barbs were a good bet. Figures. Any possibility of brain damage? With an overdose of sedatives, there's always a possibility. In this case, though, I think we got him in time. When can we see him, Doc? In about 24 hours. He might be able to tell you his name. Or do you know it? Yes, sir. When we picked him up, he was dazed, but he was still rational. His name's Kenneth Shore, age 12. 12 years old. From diapers to drugs. What's next? Prenatal goofballs? We located the parents are on the way down. Glad to hear it. Let me know when they arrive. Ought to be here any minute. Good. I want to have a talk with them. So do we. We sent a few of the capsules found on the shore boy to SID for lab analysis. 1.30 p.m., Thomas Shore, the victim's father, operated a small service station and garage in East Los Angeles. After the parents had seen their son and talked with the doctor, we interviewed them in a vacant room at Central Receiving. It's not like the doctor thinks it is at all. We're very close to Kenneth. He's loved and he knows it. He's right, Sergeant. We're as close to that boy as we know how. It's that new school. I know it. He made new friends, not like the old ones. He wouldn't even tell us their names. He hasn't been the same boy. How is he different, Miss Shaw? He's independent, I guess. Tom said he was growing up, and, and now he... <laughs> Everything will be all right, dear. Believe me. I'm sorry. I just can't help it. Who in his right mind would give drugs like that to a 12-year-old boy? A lot of people, Mr. Shore, criminals, thieves, addicts, sometimes a parent or an older brother. Sure, and when you catch them, what happens? A bunch of overage and grade judges turn them loose because you don't kiss them before you run them in. A nice slap on the wrist and they're back out on the streets. Never mind the kids' rights. The rights belong to the crumbs. Oh, don't, don't get angry. I know it's painful for you, but there's something you both should see. Now, when we picked your boy up on the freeway, this is what he had in his pockets. Those capsules. Is that what Kenneth... Yes, ma'am, we think so. That's second all. Our lab is running a test now. The doctor said you found some marijuana in Kenny's pocket. Is that it? That cigarette butt? Yes, sir. Dear God in heaven. Went the route, didn't he? Looks that way, doesn't it? I don't understand. The doctor said second all was a depressant, a sleeping pill. Kenny's always such a goer. Why would he take sleeping pills? Second all acts like sleeping pills. If you take it, then lie down and relax. If you don't, if you stay on your feet, second all can affect a person like alcohol does. There's a feeling of exhilaration. That's what the kids are looking for. Only Ken probably got impatient. What do you mean? Well, a kid pops a couple of pills and nothing happens, so he swallows a couple more. Ten or fifteen minutes later, he feels a little buzz. Suddenly, he's a real big man like the guy who's had a few drinks. He feels brave. Things begin to groove. So he pops a couple more. Before he knows it, he's taken too much, he passes out. Now, unless he gets medical attention immediately, he rarely regains consciousness. Ken got lucky. What's that paper? It's from his school. It's an examination paper. Kenny's? Yes, ma'am. It's marked 100%. I'll get a doctor. p.m. While a doctor administered to Mrs. Shore, I called the SID lab and talked with a technician, Don Hale. Bad news, sir. Yes, sir. Those capsules contain cecobarbital. Well, what happens now? As soon as your boy recovers, we'll want to get together with the three of you for counseling. You know, kids are sharp. As a rule, when they know the truth about something, they'll generally make the right decision. Sometimes that even works with adults. <laughs> When you're ready to try, let me know. How's your wife, Mr. Shore? She feel any better? Yeah. She's madder than a wet hen, though. That's so. Madder who? The doctor. He tried to give her a sedative. <laughs> 2.45 p.m., we returned to the office to file our report. 
I called the Harrison Junior High School, where Kenneth Shore was a student, and I talked with the boys' vice principal, Mr. Lee Daniels. He asked us to meet him in his office. Before 10 p.m., we drove to Harrison Junior High in East Los Angeles. Which one of my boys has been blowing pot? What makes you think it's pot, Mr. Daniels? Pills, then, and I'm not the least bit psychic. It just happens that I work in a junior high school. It's Kenneth Shore, Mr. Daniels. Kenneth Shore? Well, Ken was absent today. I called his home this afternoon, but couldn't raise anyone. What's he been up to? The boy's in Central Receiving Hospital from an overdose of secondol. His condition is critical. Oh, no. Ken... We'd like a list of his friends, Mr. Daniels, or the people he thinks are his friends. Sorry, gentlemen. Maybe I can talk to his teachers and get you a list, but Ken's only been here about a month. He's a seventh grader. I've got a couple of hundred of them. We understand, sir. Not only that, I've got a bunch of new teachers. They're the ones I'd like to see educated about the drug scene in our junior high schools. A few dig what's going on, but most of them don't. Some wouldn't even know pot from potato peelings. One or two don't even care. It's the same with the pills. The majority wouldn't know a goofball from a cantaloupe. I need someone to teach my teachers. Any volunteers? Yes, sir, our entire staff. Beg your pardon? Narcotics Division, our teacher's awareness program for drug abuse on campus. Yours for the asking, complete with lecture, slides, practical demonstrations. We're ready to help, Mr. Daniels, any time. Any time? Yes, sir, any time. I've got a teacher's meeting at 7.30 this evening. Can you be there? Yes, sir, we'll be there. Is she dead? No, ma'am. Not yet. This picture was taken at 10 p.m. The girl lived until midnight. Why is she lying on the floor? The officers were waiting for an ambulance. Now, overdose victims are subject to convulsions. Unlike a bed, they can't fall off a floor. All right, Bill, I wonder if we could have the lights, please. Right. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I pointed out earlier, it's not our intention to try and make policemen out of school teachers. But perhaps if only one person in this room had taken the time to talk to Kenneth Shore about the dangers of depressant drugs, he might not be in a hospital tonight fighting for his life. Now, that's what our teacher's awareness program is all about. I'm a little puzzled, Sergeant. I thought marijuana was the big problem, not pills. Well, sir, they're both big, and they're both serious. Two years ago, for example, approximately 80% of the arrests made by our juvenile narcotics unit were for marijuana offenses. The other 20% was charged with illegal use of barbiturates, amphetamines, LSD, and heroin. Last year, there was actually a small decline in the use of marijuana among juveniles. On the other hand, arrests for the illegal use of amphetamines and barbiturates jumped 247%. Is that so? Yes, sir, and we don't like the trend. Bill? I might add, sir, the total arrests of juveniles on all charges jumped 55% last year from the year before. Pet pills and goofballs were largely responsible. I've always wondered, what's the difference between a pet pill and a goofball? Pet pills are amphetamine sulfates, like this row here. Benzedrine, known as Benny's or White's, is the most common. Others are Dexedrine and Dexamil. The kids call them Dexies. They're exactly what the name implies, pet pills. They're rough on the body. They cause hyperactivity, intoxication, sleeplessness, reckless behavior. They speed up the pulse rate and cause distortion in time and space perception. Goofballs or barbiturates are depressant hypnotic drugs. Nembutol, known as yellow jackets. Secobarbital, commonly known as secanol or red devils. Tuanol, known as rainbows. And amatol. The kids call them bluebirds. They're sleeping pills, but depending on how they're used, they cause intoxication, stupor, euphoria, false bravery, tremendous distortion in time and space perception. Heavy use can cause the most serious type of addiction. An overdose may cause death. Any questions? Granted, uh, you've made your case against speed, LSD, heroin, and those ghastly-looking pills, but I maintain the evidence against marijuana isn't in yet. Well, sir, will you concede that it might be as harmful as alcohol? Well, all right, but it's no worse. No, sir, I hope not. Because according to U.S. government figures, between five and six million people in this country are physically and mentally sick as a result of their use of alcohol. The National Safety Council estimates that on the highways, liquor-caused property damage amounts to over $4 billion annually. As long ago as 1965, a year that incidentally was carefully researched, 29,400 Americans died on the highways in alcohol-related accidents. I think it's safe to assume that figure is even larger today. 
Now let me ask you. If marijuana possesses only half the potential of alcohol for violence, criminality, accidents, and social degradation, do we need pot? Any other observations you'd like to make, Professor? I strike my colors. You promised us a demonstration, gentlemen. I want everyone here to know exactly how marijuana smells. Yes, sir. Bill, do you want to take over? Marijuana, scientific name cannabis sativa. It's a member of the hemp family. Grows as a shrub-like plant that may attain a height of 20 feet. This, incidentally, is not the real thing. This is a demonstration kit prepared and distributed by a nationally known drug firm. Maybe you'd like to pass this around. Now, as you can see there, the marijuana leaf always contains an odd number of divisions, or leaflets, from 5 to 13. The real leaf is sticky to the touch. The sticky substance is cannabinol, which is the actual narcotic resin in the plant. The other item in the demonstration kit is an ersatz marijuana pellet. Now, we'll place it here in the ashtray, set the pellet on fire. Burning pot has a distinctive odor. Some people have described it as sweet or sickly. Would you all like to step forward? Now, some say the odor is similar to burning rope, alfalfa, or weeds. Smells terrible. Yes, ma'am. This is what marijuana smells like. I can guarantee it. I should have spoken to you about it, but I wasn't sure. What's the matter, Mrs. Rogers? I smelled it before, just this morning. Where? In the girls' restroom. Tuesday, 8.30 a.m., I checked with Central Receiving Hospital. Kenneth Shore, the overdose victim, had been transferred to the county medical hospital and was holding his own. He was not allowed visitors. 8.45 a.m., we got a call from the boys' vice principal at Harrison Junior High School. He said there'd been trouble. Daniels asked us to come right over. You got here in a hurry. What's the problem? A little beef between a teacher, Mrs. Rogers, one of my seventh graders. You met Mrs. Rogers last night. Yes, sir. The boy's name is Frederick Pine. Do you want to tell us about it? Freddie's first class today was with Mrs. Rogers. The boy came in singing at the top of his voice. Mrs. Rogers asked him to stop. He refused. He got louder and louder. When Mrs. Rogers insisted that he sit down and be quiet, Freddie blew his top. Is the boy normally hot-tempered? Not at all. And he worships Mrs. Rogers. All right, what happened then? Well, Mrs. Rogers grabbed Freddie by the arms and tried to put him in his seat. The kid broke away and started swinging. He struck Mrs. Rogers three or four times in the face. It took three other boys to put him down. By the time I got there, Freddie was singing again, quietly. I searched him. I found this. Marijuana. That's what I thought. He had these cigarette papers in his shirt pocket. Looks like young Freddie Pine's got himself a good connection. Well, did I make a mistake? How? When I went through the boys' pockets. I suppose now I'll be in trouble for making an illegal search and seizure. Not at all, sir. Really? I thought they had restrictions nowadays. Those court decisions I keep reading about. Yes, sir, but the restrictions apply to us, not to you. As a teacher or administrator, any contraband you confiscate from a student can be legally admitted as court evidence, as long as you're not working as an agent for the police. I work for one thing, the welfare of the kids in this school. Yes, sir, we understand. And that includes Freddie Pine. a.m. Frederick Pine readily admitted having smoked marijuana on the way to school that morning. He announced proudly that he'd rolled the joint himself. The boy's parents, Dr. and Mrs. Frederick Pine, arrived at the school. Dr. Pine, an East Los Angeles dentist, took over the interrogation. Now you hear me, son, and you hear me good. Where'd you get the stuff? Who gave you the grass? Ain't nobody gives you grass. All right, who sold it to you? Now answer me, I'm tired of fooling with you. I've had it, huh? Oh, you've had it like you wouldn't believe. Okay. Okay, what? Okay, I'm copping out. Good, we're waiting to hear you. Tim sold it to me. Who's Tim? He's a big guy in the ninth grade. Don't ask me his last name. Why not? I forgot it, that's why. Tim Freeman, is that who you mean? Yes, sir. Freeman, that's it. All right, now think now, Freddie. Did Tim ever offer to sell you any pills? Sure, I couldn't afford them. Did Kenneth Shore buy some? Why are you asking me that? Never mind asking why. Just answer the question. Do I have to? Come on. How about it, pal? Did Ken ever buy pills from Tim Freeman? Sure. He bought a whole slew of them. 10.55 a.m., we asked Dr. and Mrs. Pine to wait with their son in the registrar's office while Mr. Daniels, Bill, and I went to find Timothy Freeman. 
Freeman boy had a history class scheduled at 11 a.m. He was taken into custody outside the classroom. 11.15 a.m., Bill and I interviewed Timothy Freeman in the boy's vice principal's office. We advised him of his rights and asked him to empty everything out of his pockets onto the desk. Come on, boy, give. You shook me down once and I didn't have no gun. Now what do you want? Give. My old man will kill me. This what you're looking for? Reds, whites, and rainbows. All right, Tim, where'd you get them? I told you. Your father? You figure it out. Where does your father get him? What's his connection? I don't know. Honest, I don't know. Come on, son, let me ask you this. Did you sell some pills like these to Kenneth Shore? Maybe, maybe not. Come on, boy, yes or no? Is Ken dead? No, he's not dead. Why? You're lying. I heard it at school. No, we're not lying, son. You mean it? Of course we mean it. Oh, I'm so glad. I thought I killed him. 12.15 p.m., we continued to question young Tim Freeman. The boy said he lived with his parents and an 18-year-old sister in a large house on Cannon Street, eight blocks from Harrison Junior High School. In addition to the Freemans, the house was occupied by four unmarried adults and two small children. How long have you been blowing pot, son? I don't know, a couple of years. This picture, who is it? My sister, Mary. She's my best friend, too. Real pretty, isn't she? All right, Tim. Who turns you on, the grass and the pills? My old man. He says pot won't hurt anybody. What's he say about pills? If it's your bag, there ain't nothing wrong with it. Just don't get too high. Where do you think your dad learned about drugs? I don't know. Mexico, maybe. Tijuana? Yeah, TJ's a swinging town. You ever been there? Me? No. How about your dad? Does he go there often? Yeah. How often does he go to Tijuana? Every weekend. Why? two boys to Georgia Street Juvenile and booked them on Section 602 WIC. Frederick Pine was released to the custody of his parents. Timothy Freeman was detained in Juvenile Hall. 6 p.m. We obtained a search warrant, plus warrants for the arrests of all adults living at 1712 East Cannon Street, the Freeman residence.
which has seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 26th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty on three counts of furnishing to minors, possession of illegal drugs and narcotics, and with contributing to accidental death. The suspect was found guilty of possession of marijuana and with contributing to accidental death. All other adult persons living in the Freeman residence were found guilty of furnishing to minors. We're flooding the area. Uppers are amphetamine sulfate tablets, a dangerous personality destroying drug. It was up to us to choke off the flow. We'd been searching for a lead for weeks. It was beginning to look hopeless. something to say. I'd like you to hear it. He's charged with possession, amphetamine. He's been given his rights. Don't make it sound so big. This is the first time I've been busted. Yeah, but not the first time you've ever flown with co-pilots. Huh? So what? Everybody does it these no, days. No, Howie, not everybody. Meaning you? Meaning most of your generation. Yeah, sure, the squares. Maybe they're the smart ones. Think about that. Well, do it sometime. Do it now. Possession's a felony. You'll have plenty of time. Gonna sell? Not me. How do you figure that? I'm not some dumb dumb. I've got it all worked out. You have. I knew I could bust it someday. I figured the odds. That's why I did something about it. Tell us what you did. I made sure I always had something going for me. An ace in the hole. And you're going to play that ace now, is that it? Maybe. If you sweeten the pot. What's that mean? I told you, I've never been busted before. I don't want to be busted now. You already are. Tear up the ticket. Oh, no, not today. You haven't heard what I've got to say. That doesn't matter. You've been arrested and booked. Nothing changes that. I've heard hundreds of stories about the deals you guys make. I don't know anything about the stories you've heard, but we make no deals. Now, listen. I don't have a record. My slate's clean. A judge will take that into account. But I still go to jail? I'll be locked up? It's possible. Boy, I thought I had it all laid out. I'm even hoping you'll think what I've got is important. We'll let you know. All right. I tried to find out the name of the guy who sold me the uppers, but I couldn't. He never slipped, so I did the next best thing. What was that? He drives a white Dodge. I followed it. I know where he went. I memorized the address. What is it? 3245 Ascot Street. Is it important enough to put down? What was the license number? XBI 804. Is it important? Maybe. It's a lead. More than you got now. Well, I don't know. He could be just another small-time pusher. Yeah, but one thing's sure. Pushers get their supply somewhere. Yeah. Somebody makes the pills they sell. anybody's rights. You had the house leased, is that it? That's right. Two months ago, I notified the tenant I wasn't going to renew, that I wanted the house back. I've got a niece that wants it. I never received a reply to my letter, and I didn't receive a reply to the second one I sent either, or the third. So today, when the lease expired, I came over and found all the locks had been changed. Now, you can prove you own this place, can you? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Who is the tenant? He said his name was Smith. Oh, I know. I didn't believe him either. But if he wanted to lie about his name, that was his business. He paid the rent in advance every six months. That satisfied me. You haven't told me why you're here yet. We came to see this, Mr. Smith. But he's not here. You think I'd be breaking at my own door if he was? Mind if we go in with it? Mind? I'll mind if you don't. As long as you're here, you might as well be witnesses in case I have to sue him for damaging the place. Come on. My goodness, it's a factory. Yes, ma'am, it's that. Just 
look at this place. It's all covered with some kind of powder. What in the world were they making in here? We've got a pretty good idea, Miss Benstead. Now you stay right here. Amphetamine sulfate. Looks like commercial grade. 100 pounds in that box. Here's the cutting material. Milk sugar. Lactose. Commercial type mixer. Portion control scales. And the pill machine. Single stroke type. Machine like this will produce 90 pills a minute. At street prices, that's about $770 an hour. Now, you figure 100 pounds of amphetamine sulfate and roughly 500 pounds of milk sugar. You'd have to have a computer to figure the size of the return. Amphetamine empties. Yeah. Plenty of them. Here's the shipping desk. I'd say there's about 700 pills in this bag. $100 worth. Well, here's your answer. Look at this. He didn't even open them. What's that, Miss Benstead? The letters I wrote to him telling him I didn't want to renew the lease. Look at them right here on this clipboard. You got anything? All addressed to occupant. Now, Miss Benstead, we'd like you to tell us everything you can about this man Smith. I did. He came to sign the lease, paid the rent six months in advance, and went. I never saw him again. Did he give you a first name? Yes, he did. Michael. Michael Smith. What about the next six months' rent? He mailed it in cash. Could you describe him for us, please? Well, he was about an inch or so shorter than you are. Age 50, graying hair. It's difficult to describe him. He looked like so many other men. Anything unusual about the man? Anything at all you can remember about him? No, not that I can think of, except that he seemed very nice at the time. I had no idea he'd do something like this, make pills. Narcotics, aren't they? Dangerous drugs. Now, how was he dressed? Well, it was more than a year ago. I just don't remember. He was a handsome man. How do you mean that, Mrs. Benstead? Well, just that. He wasn't good-looking, but he looked good. For his age, I mean. Especially in that car of his. What kind of car? Oh, I don't know anything about cars. It was one of those good-looking ones, you know, real sporty. It wasn't white, was it? White? I don't think so. Well, it might have been, or, or silver. It was some real light color. I'll call SID and get a stakeout team on the way. Right. Well, at least we've done some good, haven't we? We've closed down the pill factory. Yes, ma'am, but that's only half of it. Oh? Now we've got to find the man who ran it. I instructed Thelma Benstead on the methods of police procedures in a case of this nature. She agreed to cooperate. One ten p.m., the Leighton Prince men arrived, along with two detectives. We briefed them, and they proceeded with their jobs to print and secure the residence. The gray-haired man in his 50s, not much to go on. Uh, looks like we got two possibilities. He'll come back to make more pills so we keep a stakeout on the place. And we check out the license number of that white Dodge. check on the license number. DMV told us it was registered to a Fred Watkins, 1612 Sycamore Street, North Hollywood. Yeah, Fred Watkins? That's right. I hope you're not selling something. You woke me up. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Oh. Well, come on in. What'd I do, run a red light? You own a white Dodge license number XBI 804? Well, yeah, it's downstairs. What's the matter? Something happened to it? Somebody hit it? It's all right, as far as we know. Well, what's the trouble, then? What are you here for? You lease a house at 3245 Ascot Street, do you? No, I live here. You know anybody at that address? I don't even know where Ascot Street is. Your car was seen there. Couldn't have been mine. No, it was yours. You're kidding. It was followed there by one of the people you sold amphetamine to. Amphetamine? What's that? What do you do for a living, Fred? I'm retired. What did you do? I repaired radios. Worked at it for 30 years. Started back in the days of the old Crosleys, Atwater, Kents, Farnsworths. Those were real radios. Well-built, well-designed, nothing cheap about any of them. They didn't have transistors in those days. Just tubes as big as light bulbs. That meant heavy chassis, heavy transformers. And we didn't fix them by simply slapping in a new part either. We fixed the old parts. I wish I had a dime for every RF coil I rewound by hand. Every IF I've rebuilt. Yeah, those were great radios in those days. Uh-huh. Is this one of them here? One of the best they ever made. Nothing like it today. How's it sound? Good, real good. Doesn't work, though, not anymore. It's just a memento. Mm -hmm. Well, you seem to know all about radios, Fred. What do you know about pills? What's a cartwheel? I don't know. How about a whitey? I 
never heard the term before. Both are street talk for amphetamine sulfate tablets. I told you. I don't know anything about that stuff. How about Thelma Benstead? Who's she? She owns that house over on Ascot Street. Oh, look, I haven't got anything to do with any house on any street. Ever been in trouble before, Fred? No, I haven't, and I'm not in trouble now. You sure about that, are you? You bet I'm sure. I haven't done anything, so you can't prove I have, no matter how hard you try. What if we want to search this place? It wouldn't worry me. In fact, go ahead. You got my permission. Fine, but listen to this first. You have the right to remain silent. If you give up the right to remain silent, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge before questioning. Now, do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Sure, I understand them, but I'm still giving you permission to search the place. Start in here, start in the bathroom, anywhere you like. All right, Fred, fine. We'll start with your radio. Radio? Why bother with that antique? I don't know. Anybody who keeps an old-time radio without repairing it just doesn't figure to me. I didn't have the parts. You can't buy those tubes anymore. I told you I just hung on to it as a keepsake. A lot of memories there. <laughs> Is that right? You're wrong about one thing, Fred. Not many memories in these. Shots were taken, and we requested the photo lab to give us a high-speed rush in the hope that the landlady, Thelma Benstead, could identify him as the man who leased her premises. We checked with R and I. Watkins had no previous record. Now look, you won't find anything in my stuff, and I ain't going to say anything, and you can't prove anything. We can prove one thing right now: possession. Well, sure, but that's all. And I got no record, so I'll get a suspended sentence. Now that we can tie you in with that factory on Ascot Street. You won't. Go ahead and try. You won't get anywhere. We think we might. Who'll say so? Somebody who says he saw me drive there? So what? I was visiting. I went to the wrong address. I stopped to ask directions. All right, Fred. Who's Michael Cooper? What? Michael Cooper. Who is he? I don't know any Michael Cooper. Well, now, he wrote you a check. $200 worth. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember now. He's the guy I loaned some money to. Maybe he's the one who makes the pills. Maybe we ought to check him out. You'll be wasting your time. Well, now, we got lots of it, Fred. Suppose you tell us where we can find him. I haven't got any idea. Got that Ascot Street address, maybe? He hasn't got anything to do with it. Well, now, guess. somebody does. Suppose you tell us who. <sighs> sure, sure. All right. I do. You leased the house? That's right. For the purpose of making amphetamine sulfate tablets? Yeah. Tell us about the big man. What do you mean, big man? I don't know any big All man. All right, Fred, your partner, then. I got no partner. I ran the place myself. You mean the entire operation was yours? You ran the whole thing? That's right. All your own idea. Look, I said it was my setup, didn't I? I said I ran the whole thing myself. You bought the machines. You ordered the drugs. You did everything. Yes, I did. I did all those things. What's the matter? Don't you believe me? Oh, we might, except for one small thing. Yeah, what's that? The man who set up that factory now, I doubt he'd be stupid enough to stash a bag of tablets inside a radio. Now, what do you think? Joe, see you a minute. Just got back from the Benstead woman's apartment. Show her the mugs. How we doing? We're batting zero. Yeah. She swears Watkins is not the man she rented that house to. says he's responsible for the whole operation and you don't buy it. That's right. Okay, let's say you're right and I think you are. That brings us to the next question. Why is Watkins willing to take the fall? Well, he hasn't got a record and convicted he'd pull a light sentence. You think he wants to take the rap for somebody else? That's what we think. Possible it's done often enough. We think Watkins and whoever he works for had it all arranged just in case we tumble to the factory. Watkins serves a light sentence and gets a big payoff from somebody. Yes, sir, that's how we see it. Makes sense, but it raises another question. Who does he work for and how do we find him? Any ideas? One, maybe. Might pay off. What do you got in mind? So far, there are only two other names connected with this deal. Smith and Cooper. And Smith doesn't take us any place. That's right. But Cooper's different. Maybe. Watkins had a check from him in his pocket. It was drawn on a downtown bank. They gave us his home address. You run it down? No, sir, not yet. But we did check R&I and DMV. Michael Cooper drives the kind of car the Benstead woman remembers. A silver-gray charger. Go on. 
And he has a record of previous H&S violations. Sounds good, but you'll need more to tie him in. Yes, sir, but it's a start. If he's the man behind that factory, knocking it over won't sting him too bad. Yeah, we're ahead of you. He can always set up another one. a.m. Michael Cooper lived in a Beverly Hills penthouse. His houseboy told us he could be found at a private tennis club. It wasn't hard to locate Cooper. Everybody seemed to know him. (laughs) (laughs) Excuse me. You're Michael Cooper? That's right. New members? Well, welcome to the club. Let me buy you a drink. No, sir. We'd like to talk to you. All right. You hit the bar, folks. On my tab. Yes? We're police officers, Miss Cooper. Oh, of course. I've been expecting you. Shall we sit down? I think I deserve a break. I played four sets this morning. Yes, sir. You know, great game, tennis. Keeps you young. No better way to stay in shape. You can keep your vitamin capsules and your pills. Good, clean air, regular exercise. That's the way to a full life. Yes, sir. You know, the great people, tennis players. That's because it's a social activity that requires great diligence. Attracts the right kind. You seem to have a lot of friends. Oh, it's just a title. I was elected club president last month, purely an honorary position, but it is gratifying. Now, gentlemen, I know you didn't come out here to discuss tennis with tennis players. Tell me, what can I do for you? You know a man named Fred Watkins? Of course I do. And I'm sure you know that. You wouldn't be here otherwise. There's no need to be coy. I believe in being perfectly frank with everybody, and I like people who return the compliment. When did you see Watkins last? Oh, uh, seven or eight days ago we met for lunch. But I talked to him on the phone this morning. I intend to provide legal counsel for Fred. Tell us about the house on Ascot Street. What do you want to know? You don't deny knowing about it? (laughs) Certainly not. Why should I? I've committed no crime. That house was used to manufacture drugs. Do you know that? Amphetamine tablets. I know. Fred told me that this morning. I was absolutely appalled. You'd think a man Fred's age would be wiser. If I'd known that's why he wanted the house, I never would have signed the lease. You put the lease in your name, did you? That's right. I had to. You see, Fred, unfortunately, has a long record of bad debts. He was sure the owner of the house would never have run it to him. You were just doing him a favor, is that it? Precisely. That's your story? Of course. It's the truth. You paid the rent. You also wrote him a check for $200, is that right? That's correct. Are you wondering why? Well, there's an excellent reason. Fred and I were in the Army together, and on one occasion he saved my life. After that, of course, we became the best of friends, and we've been that way ever since. Always ready to help each other whenever the occasion arose. In short, gentlemen, I'll do anything for Fred, and he'll do anything for me. He can go to prison for you. Why, yes, now that you mention it, I'm sure he would. Now, do you have another question? I'm sure I have an answer for it. You used the name Smith on the lease. Why? Well, it's my legal name. No, it is, really. Michael Cooper Smith. I got dreadfully tired of so many raised eyebrows each time I used it. I became simply Michael Cooper. But let me assure you, Smith is still my legal name and the one by which, under law, I must sign all legal documents. Everything's strictly legal. Of course. I wouldn't have it any other way. And I know you wouldn't. Friday, November 7th, 4 p.m. Three days had passed. So far, our investigation had turned up only one disproving fact. Neither Cooper nor Watkins had served in the Army. Joe, Bill, I'll give it to you straight. I just got back from the DA's office. While you were out in the field, I got a call from the county jail that Fred Watkins felt targeted. I went over to see him. He gave me a full cop-out. What do you have to say? According to Watkins, he talked Cooper into loaning him money. He also talked Cooper into renting that house for him. But Watkins set up that factory all by himself. Leaving Cooper in the clear. If that goes before a judge, Watkins will be convicted of everything he confessed to. He'll establish the fact that he was the only one involved in setting up that factory and the only one connected with its operation. And you know what that means. Yes, sir, we do. We'll have one fine time connecting Cooper with the crime afterwards. Even if we did, I can hear his lawyers now. They'd say one man had already confessed to the charges we were bringing against Cooper. They'd point out one man was already convicted on those charges and was serving time as a result. That's it. If the evidence we had was strong enough, we might get a conviction, but it wouldn't amount to much. Cooper would be out on the street in no time. Free to set up another pill plant. We need that evidence now, Joe, today, before Watkins goes to trial. We need to slam the cell door on Cooper before Watkins pleads guilty, not after. Watkins goes to trial in ten days doesn't give us much time. I know, but it's all we've got. Make it do. Work around the clock. Retrace every step you've taken. Talk to all the witnesses again. Search that house a second time and a third time if you have to, but get that evidence. We've already gone over the house with a fine-tooth comb. Only got one thing to say to that, Gannon. What's that? Get a finer comb. November 8th, 4.10 p.m. We searched the house on Ascot Street again. The machinery and other things were scheduled to go to property division the next day and be held as evidence. Anything? Not a thing. We've gone through this entire joint three times. Yeah, I know. It doesn't figure, does it? What's that? Everybody makes mistakes. Cooper's no different. 
You're forgetting something. Yeah, what's that? He might never have been here. It's still his operation. Want to hit the bedroom again? No, whatever it is ought to be right in this room. I keep telling myself the same thing, Joe, but I don't believe me. See something? Maybe. Take a look. Manufactured by Furby Limited, Orange, New Jersey. Yeah, but that machine's years old, Joe. Could have been resold three or four times. Yeah, but that hasn't. Looks like a new motor. It's just been repaired October this year. Acme Electric, Armatures Rewound, Princess Street, Santa Barbara. Well, somebody paid to have that work done. There'll be a name on the bill for the job, won't there? So far, so good. What now? Those empty bags. We've already checked them two times. Let's make it three. 5.40 p.m. We checked 674 bags. Again, we found nothing. 775, 770. Wait a minute. What's that? Oh, just some trash that was in there before. Let's check it. Looks like somebody emptied a couple of ashtrays. Some bottle caps. Pieces of paper. Looks like a torn up calendar page. Some writing on the back. What's it say? Can you read it? One bag. And it looks like part of the word amphetamine. Let me know that. Get the rest of those pieces. Let's see if we can put something together here. Yeah, there's another one. enough. Using blender, mix one bag amphetamine. The formula for uppers. And it's going to give us one more ingredient, isn't it? Whoever wrote that formula. Monday, November 10th, 1120 a.m. We turned the formula we found over to SID. Officer Tom Evans, their handwriting expert, was ready to give us his findings. Any comparison? See for yourself. Compare the A in dollar with the A in amphetamine. Notice the shading in each. Notice the pen lift before each starting stroke. The overlap of the upstroke and the final downstroke in each. Now look at the D in dollar and the D in blender. See the loops in the vertical strokes? And notice how the downstrokes fail to reach the horizontal plane before making the starting stroke of the next letter. The same thing happens with the eyes in mix and the signature. The downstrokes fail to reach the horizontal. Also, both resemble inverted Vs. And the fact that neither has a dot is significant. What's your conclusion, Tom? I'd say the check signed by Michael Cooper and the formula were written by the same man. Joe, Bill, Tom, Lieutenant. Tom's made his comparison the handwriting checks. In my opinion, it could be argued. It won't be. Take a look at these replies to your wife. New Jersey, Furby Limited reports selling a number of used machines to Michael Cooper Smith. Santa Barbara, Acme Electric repaired a motor for a Mr. Michael Cooper. That does it. We got a case. Only one more thing we need. Michael Cooper Smith. Pick him up. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 5th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the accused, Michael Cooper Smith and Fred C. Watkins, guilty on two counts of violating Section 11911 of the Health and Safety Code, possession of dangerous drugs, and guilty on two counts of violating Section 11912 of the Health and Safety Code, manufacturer of dangerous drugs. The penalties for such violations are terms in the state prison of not less than one year and not more than three. It should be. I had a busy week. Mm -hmm. Fact is, I've never seen it busier. Two funerals, five serious injuries, and I personally investigated seven restricted duty cases. Yeah, one leave of absence, five blood donor requests, you published the restricted duty list, and you audited the floral fund. What's your point? No point, Joe. I just wanted you to know how busy I was. Oh, I do. You got it all right here in your progress report. Well, don't you have anything else to say? Like what? Joe, you're the officer in charge of this section, right? Right. We've just finished our fifth working day, right? Right. You haven't met your obligation as a supervisor, Joe. Oh, well, how's that? Recognition. An employee is motivated through recognition. Five days now, and you haven't so much as told me I was doing a good job. Did you decide to start studying for sergeant again? Is that it? Thought I'd take a crack at it. What are you studying now? Principles of Leadership by Winslow. Why? I'd say you were on Chapter 3, right? 
Yeah, employee motivation. How'd you know? Oh, just a wild guess. This is a good report. In fact, it's excellent. I'm sure the captain will think so, too. Just my usual good work, Joe. You bet. And I'm real fortunate to have you working with me. Yeah, I feel the same way. You are fortunate. Well, now, since it's Friday, and just to show my appreciation, we'll knock off now and take the next two days off. How's that? That's real big of you, since we're five minutes over anyway. Medical section, Friday. Where? How bad are they? Anybody else? All right, we'll meet you at Central Receiving. Right away. You can call Eileen from the hospital. You're gonna be late for dinner. What's gone down? Two officers and one suspect in a shootout at 7th and Broadway. How bad? They can't tell. Both policemen are unconscious. Bill and I drove to Central Receiving Hospital. In addition to providing emergency service to the public, the hospital cares for all Los Angeles police and firemen injured on duty. 5.15 p.m., we arrived at the hospital prior to the ambulance carrying the two injured officers. Our job was to coordinate with the receiving hospital any problems related to the care of the injured officers, to cause all concerned persons to be notified, and to aid the officers' families as necessary. One of the suspects. How many were there? Two. Where's the other one? Downtown? No, he got away clean. I don't recognize him. Rich Stevens, Central Division. Been on the job 11 months. Frank Miller. I didn't know he was still working a central radio car. I take it you knew him. Yeah, the three of us used to work vag detail on East Fifth. That goes back a few years. Yeah, it sure does. Frank broke us both in. Joe, Bill, you on this one? Yes, sir. OK, I'll let you know as soon as I make the preliminary. Right. What kind of caper was it? Liquor store 211 went down about 5 o'clock. Miller and Stevens were driving by when the suspects came out. Rolling on the call, were they? No call. They were on routine patrol. A citizen hailed them down. According to witnesses, Stevens was shot as the first suspect came out of the liquor store. Miller was able to return fire and hit the suspect. He had the liquor store at background. That's the one we have in custody? Right. Miller didn't have the same luck with number two. He was trying to drag Stevens to cover when the other suspect ran out. He got Stevens out of the way, then tried to get the people on the street out of the line of fire. And that's when number two opened up on him. Witnesses said Miller wouldn't return fire. He kept yelling for the people on the street to get out of the way. The suspect kept shooting at Miller, and Miller started pushing people inside the liquor store and behind cars. You can imagine what 7th and Broadway was like at 5 o'clock. Looked like the Battle of the Bulge. Yeah, especially on Friday. Total confusion just leaving work. Is that when Frank bought it? People said he'd been hit a couple of times by then. He kept going, though. Some lady froze on the sidewalk. He ran up and pushed her behind the car. The liquor store owner said the suspect fired three times then and knocked Miller flat. The suspect ran around the corner, and that's the last anybody's seen of him. Any idea who he is? Nope. His partner's not talking. Who's handling at the scene? Homicide shooting team. They were there when I left. Mac, is Stevens married? Yeah, he has two small children. OK. We'll make the rest of the notifications, except for the wives. That has to be done in person. You know that. Mac, you drop by Juvenile. Pick up a policewoman to babysit the Stevens children. Now, when you bring Mrs. Stevens down here, bring it to her easy, will you? We don't know anything about their men's condition, so let's be optimistic, huh? Right. I'll make the rest of the notifications. And get Central on the phone. Arrange to have a sergeant pick up Frank Miller's wife. Check the flow. Vital signs every 15 minutes. How are they doing? It's a little too early to tell exactly. Miller was hit five times. There are only two exit wounds, so there's still three slugs inside that have to come out. His right lung collapsed. There's evidence of other internal bleeding. We'll know more after x-rays. How about Stevens? Shot twice in the abdomen, both still inside. Same story with him. We have to get x-rays. We've done just about all we can here. Preliminary treatment, blood plasma, some bandages. How would you classify their conditions, Doc? Serious? Critical? I won't hazard a guess at this point, Joe, for what they've been through, and judging from preliminary tests, they're doing better than one could expect. A bullet does crazy things when it hits a man's body. It can go straight as an arrow, it can shatter or bounce all over inside. When we see the x-rays, I'll have a better idea of the kind of surgery they're going to need. Do you have the wives coming in? Yes, sir. Should be here any time now. And you're wondering what to tell them? No, Doc. Like every other time, not so much what, but how. I've been at this for 39 years. I don't have an answer for you, Joe.
guess they had to cut them off to keep from moving them too much. Yeah. 18 bucks. What's that? I said $18. That's what these uniform shirts cost now. Yeah, so I've heard. A real cut up. No chance of having them sewn. Just gonna have to buy new shirts, Joe. I hope they do. What's his condition? Bullet wound, right thigh, through and through. He's been treated. Cleansed, dressed, and a tetanus shot. That's it. You booking him in? Jail ward at County General. Hear that, cop? A week or two, I'll be brand new. Find out who he is yet? Yeah, I'll name Schaffner, Lauren Schaffner. He's been around. He's done hard time at Leavenworth, two years at Chino, and his last stint was in San Quentin for armed robbery. You carrying a tail, fella? No tail, cop. I did it all. I don't like those parole jerks following me around. They get in my way. What about his partner? That's for me to know, cop. You'll never find out who he is. I'll see to that. You can't stand it, can you? We got a good piece of a couple of you pigs, and you got nothing. You should have seen the look on that cop's face when I popped those caps. He squirmed like a pig. You're real proud of yourself, aren't you, Schaffner? You can bet on it, cop. You know, one thing I can't figure, this loyalty angle of yours, you just gotta protect that other creep, don't you? I'm no think. Besides, you do the same for me. Oh, he already proved that, didn't he? Sure. Sure, like leaving you bleeding on the sidewalk. <laughs> At 5.50 p.m., the wife of Officer Frank Miller was brought to the hospital. The staff made the nurse's coffee room available for our use. Virginia Miller was a veteran wife of a veteran policeman. Oh, thank you. Is there anything else you can tell me? No, ma'am, we've just about covered it. We'll have to wait until they get out of x-ray before we know any more. They? You mean Frank wasn't the only one hurt? I'm sorry, I didn't realize you hadn't been told. His partner was shot twice. They're both in x-ray now. Oh, no. Who was he working with? a probationary officer by the name of Stevens. Rich Stevens? Yes, ma'am, you know him? No, I've never met him before, but Frank talks about him all the time. In fact, he talks about all the young ones he breaks in. He said Rich was a real comer, to use his words. How much time does Frank have on the job now, Mrs. Miller? 23 years. That sounds like a long time. But it seems like it was only yesterday I watched Frank graduate from the academy. I was carrying our oldest son, Kenneth, then. Joe, this is Mrs. Stevens. Sergeant Friday, Officer Gannon. How do you do? do man. Thank you, Mac. Miss Stevens, I'd like you to meet Virginia Miller. This is Officer Frank Where's Miller. Where's Rich? I want to see him. I'm afraid that's not possible now, ma'am. They're both in X-ray. Shouldn't be long before we know. Know what? Whether he's going to live or die? Wouldn't you like to sit down, Miss? No, I wouldn't like to sit down. Now, Mrs. Stevens, we don't know much about your husband's condition yet. That's what those X-rays are for. As soon as we find out, you'll be told right away. I knew something like this would happen. I just knew it. I told Rich, but he wouldn't listen. I didn't want him to join the police department in the first place. I told him it was too dangerous. I told him. Mrs. Stevens, sometimes these things just happen. Oh, sure they happen. To people that are stupid or childish enough to be police. Didn't have to, you know. My father offered him a good job, twice the money he's making now. But, oh, no. He was too proud for that. He had to make it his own way. Couldn't take a decent job like most people. I hardly ever see him between going to work and going to court. The children think he's a stranger. I know what you're going through, Mrs. Stevens. Try to take it easy if you can. What do you know? Do you sit at home? Do you have to take care of the children by yourself? Don't try to tell me to take it easy. Look at us, all waiting in here, not knowing. Is that the kind of life to lead? Never knowing? Waiting? Waiting to know whether your husband's going to live or die? You take it easy, Mr. Policeman. It's not your life that's coming to an end on that operating table. Six twenty p.m. The X-ray examinations were complete. We were called for a briefing. Doctor C. Harry Lindsley was in charge of the case. Gunshot wounds were not new to him. His tenure with Central Receiving Hospital as the police and fire physician amounted to more gunshot cases than any five surgeons would see in a lifetime. They're both being prepared for surgery now. How serious are they, Doc? Let me show you the x-rays. This is a younger officer, Stevens. Now, as I told you before, he still has two slugs in him. One here, one here. 
I'm sure this first bullet did quite a bit of internal damage. The path, judging from the entrance wound and the termination point, indicates that we probably have damage to the upper part of the transverse colon, the stomach, and where it appears to have ended up, the liver. That's the first one we'll work on. Where was the entrance wound? Right about here, midpoint in the rib cage. Apparently, that was the first shot that struck him, and the force must have spun him around. Why do you think that? Because of the other entrance wound. It was in the lower part of his back at an angle. The bullet traveled across his back and lodged right here between two of the lumbar vertebrae. I've called in a specialist for consultation and surgery. If the spinal cord isn't already damaged, the surgery will be touch and go. And if it is? If it's damaged and if he survives surgery, he'll be permanently paralyzed. Now, Frank Miller. Five entrance wounds. Two in the upper chest, one in the abdomen, one in the throat, one in his left shoulder. The throat and shoulder wounds were through and through. The trachea has been damaged. We have already performed a tracheotomy. But to make matters worse, his right lung has collapsed from one of the chest wounds. So far, we've been able to keep him breathing. The other two wounds have caused severe internal bleeding. One bullet's very close to his heart. He lost a lot of blood. His resistance is dropping. I've also called in a specialist for him. Can you speculate on their chances, Doc? Right now, the odds are against both of them. A lot depends on how they stand up in surgery. They're both in deep shock. That contributes to the impairment of the nervous system's control over the muscular arteries. Those arteries influence the amount of blood flowing to organs and are vital to the body. That control is impaired in shock and can cause circulatory failure. I'm sure you can see what we're up against. Their injuries are numerous and have caused many side effects. So like I said, surgery and the initial recovery period will tell the story. Doesn't sound too encouraging, does it? No, it doesn't. I've been digging bullets out of policemen for a long time, Bill. Yes, sir. These two are as bad as I've seen. p.m., Bill and I went to the nurse's coffee room to inform Virginia Miller and Melissa Stevens of their husband's conditions. The poor thing. Just exhausted herself. The nurse gave her something to quiet her down. How's she feeling now? A little better. I think the only thing that's keeping her going is her bitterness toward the department. She refused to lie down in one of the rooms. How are you feeling, Miss Miller? Trying to stay optimistic. I called my son, Kenneth, but he'd already gone to work. I guess he'll find out when he gets there. I imagine the word's all over the department by now, anyway. Ma'am? My son. He's been a policeman for about a year now. With L.A.? Naturally. Kenneth made his own decision when he graduated from college. Starting a family tradition, huh? We are. And when those two get together, all they do is talk shop. I can't get a word in edgewise. But you're not here to talk about that, are you? We have the results on the x-rays. Both men are in surgery now. Just a minute. She should know. Melissa. Come on, honey, wake up. Rich? Rich, you all right? Melissa. Wake up, honey. Melissa? Huh? What's the matter? Something happened? Sergeant Friday and Officer Gannon are here. They want to give us the x-ray results. Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have fallen asleep. Are you all right now? Yes, yes, I'm all right. Before they tell us... I'd like you to listen to me for a minute, okay? I was married to Frank before he joined the police department. And I've been with him the whole 23 years he's been a policeman. Is that supposed to be something to be proud of? Well, in my own way, I'm proud, yes. Not just because he's a policeman, but because he's happy. Before Frank joined the department, he worked for an accountant. He was miserable most of the time. And the reason he was, was because he felt useless. Like he wasn't doing anything really worthwhile. After being on the job for a few years, he became eligible for the sergeant's examination. And that's when I really learned how satisfied he was with what he was doing. He didn't take that examination, or any sense. Frank believed he was making an important contribution doing exactly what he was doing. Oh, sure, the job has its ups and downs. There were good days when things went right, and. A lot of bad ones when he saw things you and I would never see in a lifetime. I'll never forget the time he found a little ten-year-old boy who had been missing for two days. Well, that boy had welts all over his back and arms. And The reason the child ran away from home was because his father beat him and his mother did nothing to stop it. You know what Frank said when it was over? He said... Thank God there's somebody around to protect an innocent child. It makes everything else worthwhile. That's a great part of what my job's all about. 
Oh, don't you see, Melissa? Your husband. My husband. They have more than just a job. They're making a contribution, and they feel it. That's important to a man, Melissa, very important, to feel he's making a contribution. From what I've seen in my husband, it's a good feeling. He's happy, and I'm a part of that happiness. Tell me something, Mrs. Miller. Are you happy now? I know that Frank was doing what he had to do. I wish I could feel that way, Mrs. Miller, but I just can't. I hate everything about his job. And now look what it's done to him. Is that what you call making a contribution? Being shot down in the street by some filthy animal? And what am I supposed to do? Find satisfaction in this great contribution while he could very well be dying? You might do what I've been doing, Melissa. What's that? Praying. Mrs. Miller, I started praying the day Rich took this job. What good has it done? Six forty-five p.m. After informing the wives of their husbands' conditions, we called the parish house at the request of Virginia Miller. She wanted a priest. Six fifty-five p.m. The officers had been in surgery for twenty-five minutes. In line with normal procedure, I called the chief of police to give him a progress report. 7 p.m., Father George Thomas arrived from the parish house. We informed him of the circumstances. He agreed to remain with the wives until the completion of surgery. 8.30 p.m., both officers were still undergoing surgery. 8.45 p.m., the homicide team assigned to the case checked in. The second suspect was still outstanding. They had no leads. 9.15 p.m., surgery continued. We checked in on the wives. Any word? Not yet, Father. They're still in surgery. Been a long wait. How are the women? As well as can be expected. Mrs. Stevens has settled down considerably. I hope she has the faith and courage to carry her through. Have you been able to talk with her? With the aid of Mrs. Miller. I pray we've given her at least a thread to hang on to. Yes, sir. It's not very much, is it? Thread. Sergeant Friday wanted in recovery. Sergeant Friday wanted in recovery. 9.25 p.m. The surgery on the two officers had been completed. We waited for the results. Mrs. Stevens, your husband's going to be fine. No damage to the spinal cord. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Recovery room two. Frank had a tough go. He's critical. Room one. He's come with us. Frank. Oh, Frank. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the Lord forgive you by this holy anointing whatever sin you have committed. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Sergeant Friday, Officer Gannon, I want to apologize about the way I acted today. That's all right, Miss Stevens. We understand. He looks fine. First thing he wanted to know is if they caught the other suspect. Can you be all right? Frank's dead. I'm so sorry. I'm glad Rich is going to be all right, Melissa. You take care of him. You understand? You love him like you've never loved him before.
again. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 20th, trial was held in Department 50, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. <laughs> The suspect was found guilty of murder in the first degree, which is punishable by death or confinement in the state prison for life. Lawrence Schaffner refused to disclose the identity of the second suspect, who is still at large. Department of Water and Power. When we got back to the office, we met a representative from another city department with a problem. The employee was George Watson, Department of Animal Regulation. We didn't know if we could help him or not but we told him we'd try. six months not too bad why there doesn't seem to be anything real pressing right now does there captain i didn't ask for a recap on the division workload what's on your mind uh well there's this case we'd kind of like to look into it has to do with a bunch of lost dogs lost dogs what are you talking about friday you part of this well yes sir you see i see nothing both of you better reread the department manual the jurisdiction for lost dogs lies solely with the department of animal regulation you know that don't you yes sir we know that but there's a little more to it than just a straight loss we think there's possible criminal activity here, and we thought you might feel the same way. All right, let's have it. Yes, sir. Well, George Watson from Animal Regulation was just in. Now, he's had about 20 reports of lost dogs from the El Centro Shopping Center over the last couple of months. His records show only one dog reported lost from the area before this rash of reports. He thinks they've been stolen, that it? Yes, sir, he does. Watson talked to the owners when reports were made, and just about all of them indicated they didn't remember leaving the windows down as far as they were when they got back to their cars. What kind of dogs were they? Different breeds, Captain, all purebred. Watson gave us this list of victims. We figure the dogs are possibly put up for sale or maybe used for breeding purposes. Watson says their market value runs all the way from 100 to to $1,000. Yeah, I know they can get expensive. I bet the owners don't give a hang about the money, though. Sir? This one, for example. German Shepherd. Answers to the name of King. You can bet these people had a lot of feeling for this dog. You can really get attached, you know. Yes, sir, I guess you can. We had a shepherd once. Called her Queenie. What a dog she was. Those big almond-shaped eyes are looking up at you. You know what that dog used to do? Uh, no, sir. What was that? She'd bring me the mail from the mailbox every day, if that wasn't something. But she wouldn't give it to me till I'd scratch behind her ears and thank her. And did she watch over the kids? <laughs> they called her Keenie. Couldn't say Queenie, you know. But let some stranger look at him cross-eyed, she'd act like she was going to tear him apart. Great dog. Almost human, you know? Yes, sir. Oh, Queenie. Lived to be almost 16. Like losing a member of the family. Well, what do you think, Skipper? Shall we look into it? Cap? Huh? Can we work the case? Oh, yeah, yeah. Get right on it. Could be a lot more to this than just lost dogs. We have the time. Run it down. Yes, sir. Friday, Cannon. Yes, sir. And have a little empathy. The people you're going to be dealing with have suffered more than just a monetary loss. It's like losing one of the family, you know? Yes, sir, we understand that. found in the garage. 
I left that note on the front door in case somebody found Duke and brought him home. We have our address and phone number on his collar, you know. Yes, sir. It sure is nice of you boys to help out. Didn't know the police department got involved in this sort of thing. We usually don't, Mr. Bentley, but this is kind of a special case. Well, I'm beholden to that. Duke's real special to us. The wife bought him about a year or so ago. She's an invalid. Arthritis put her in a wheelchair several years ago. The dog makes a good companion for her, is that it? He does that. Or I should say he did. I wasn't much on dogs at the time. But I swear that Duke got part of me so wrapped up, I miss him more than the wife does. Is this Duke? Yes, sir. That's him. Well, now, he's a mighty fine-looking English setter, Mr. Bentley. I'll tell you that. Appreciate your compliment, but he's a clumber spaniel. Oh, is that so? Yes, sir. Duke has a fine background. Dates back to the 1750s. English ancestry, I suppose. His breed was brought along in France. Oh, I see. A Frenchman by the name of Noir developed the breed. It wasn't until 1760 he gave a bunch of them to the Duke of Newcastle over in England. That's the reason you call your dog Duke, because of the Duke of Newcastle. Oh, I don't know. I'd say it was a toss-up. No, I was a Duke, too. That was kind of a thing in those days, for noblemen to give dogs back and forth as presents. I was making this for Duke. Wanted to give him a present on his birthday next week. How do you like it? It's quite a doghouse, Mr. Bentley. Most folks would think I was crazy building all this for a dog, but Duke's all the wife and I have. It was her idea at first... She found this drawing of the Duke's castle and thought it'd be nice to make him a replica. The castle belonged to the Duke of Noailles? No, the Duke of Newcastle. The Clumber was the name of the Duke's estate. That's where the dog got its name, Clumber Spaniel. Oh, sure. Just about finished now. Kind of got in my blood once I started. Keeps our hope up we'll get him back. Take a look in here. Get right down here. Take a look inside. Kick that light switch on right beside you there. The wife used to be an interior decorator. She did the inside. Rugs, wallpaper chandelier, and even the Duke of Newcastle's coat of arms. See it back there? Isn't that something? Yes, sir, it sure is. Never seen anything like it, Mr. Bentley. I added a little special touch, too. Kick that button there, Sergeant. And then if Duke wants to get out, why, there's another button on the inside. Kind of adds that medieval touch, you know? You think Duke will be able to work those switches, do you? I know he will. Smart as a whip. Why, Duke will have that drawbridge mastered quick as a wing. That is, if we ever get him back. Has he ever run away before, Mr. Bentley? No, sir. He's always been real obedient. I'd tell him to stay, and he'd stay put till I told him to move. I guess he got kind of mixed up, though. How's that, sir? At that shopping center. He probably jumped out of the car window to go looking for me, then got himself lost. It's a big place, you know. Yes, sir. Now, do you remember leaving the window down far enough for him to jump out? Well, tell the truth, I'm kind of confused about that. How do you mean? Well, I thought I'd left it down just a few inches. But I must have had other things on my mind because it was down darn near all the way when I got back to the car. Which window was it? The one on the driver's side. Did you lock your car? Yes, sir. What about when you returned? Was it still locked? Yes, sir. I remember because I had to use my key to get in. Well, what's all this have to do with finding Duke? Well, you see, Mr. Bentley, a fairly easy way of getting into a car when the window is partially open is to run a wire down through the opening. It's an easy matter to pull up the lock. You mean you think somebody stole Duke? It's a possibility, Mr. Bentley. That's why we're looking into it. No, I can't believe that. Dogs just jump out of cars once in a while. It happened to my wife's friend a few days ago at the same shopping center, as a matter of fact. Did she report it? I don't know whether she did or not, but she got her dog back inside of two days. Oh, she found it? No, sir. Somebody else did. Eula, that's her name, Eula Van Meter. She put in an ad in the classifieds, and this fellow read it and delivered the dog right to her door. Now, this ad, Mr. Bentley, was a reward offered? Yes, sir. Hundred dollars. She was happy to pay it, same as me. Oh, is that right? I put an ad in myself this morning, offered 200 reward, and Duke's worth every dime of it. I love that dog, Sarge. I'm not ashamed to say so. I just love him. It's not how much he's worth in dollars. Yes, sir, we understand. A personal pet. How do you put a value on that? Although not believing his dog had been stolen, Myron Bentley agreed to notify us in the event someone answered his newspaper ad. Bentley gave us the address of his wife's friend, Eula Van Meter. We drove over to talk to her. Oh, Zardy just loves everybody. Well, I shouldn't wonder. He's certainly a mighty fine-looking Irish wolfhound. Uh, he's an Afghan hound from one of the finest breeding lines in the country. Oh, sure. I guess I just got the breeds mixed up. Well, I can't understand why. There isn't the slightest resemblance. No, I can see that. What did you say your dog's name was, ma'am, Zardy? Yes, I call him Zardy. It's short for Zardan. Oh, that's very interesting. Zardy, short for Zardan. Do you recognize the name? Well, I... Not many people do, you know. It is refreshing to meet someone who really knows the history of the breeding lines. Oh, I try to keep up on things. Yes, 
Zardan was the first Afghan hound, at least the first to be exhibited to the world. I thought it would be nice to name Zardi after his famous ancestor. I can't agree with you more, ma'am. After all, Zardan was the first. What was that man's name again? I have the hardest time remembering. Oh, what man is that? You know, the one that exhibited Zardan in England for the first time. It was 1907. Oh, well, the uh, name slips my mind right now. Barr, that's it. Mr. T.A. Barr. Right, T.A. Barr. He's the one that exhibited Zardan for the first time in England, 1907. Yes. You know, I thought I lost my Zardy for good. Yes, ma'am, that's why we're here, Miss Van Meter. Now, what were the circumstances surrounding the loss of the dog? Oh, the silly thing jumped out of the car while I was in the pet store buying him a new collar. Where was that, the El Centro shopping center? Why, yes, just three days ago. I didn't know what to do when I got back to the car and found Zardy gone. Did you notify the animal shelter? No, I didn't even think of that. Now, what condition was your car in when you found him missing? Condition? Yes, ma'am, I mean the windows, the doors. Oh, well, that was my fault, all right. And I'll tell you, it won't happen again. What's that? I left the front window roll down so far, Zardy just jumped out. You sure you left the window down? Well, I must have. It was down and Zardy was gone. Did it seem at all strange to you, ma'am? The window being down? Well, yes, I guess it did. I always make a habit of leaving it down just far enough for Zardy to get some air. In fact, for a minute there, I thought I was going crazy. But you forget things like that when you're in a hurry. Well, now, in other words, your first recollection was that you left the windows rolled up. Now that you mention it, yes, that's right. Now, you didn't notify the animal shelter, but I understand you placed an ad in the newspaper. Is that right? Yes, sir. And am I glad I did. This nice man read the ad the first night it was placed and brought Zardy back to me. Did you offer a reward? One hundred dollars. But I didn't pay that. You didn't pay that. I gave him $50 extra. I was so happy to get Zardy back, you know. Can you describe this man to us, ma'am? Well, he was young, about 20, and uh, kind of small, 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, somewhere in there. Hair and eyes? Hair dark, eyes light. Did you happen to notice what kind of car he was driving? Why, yes, I used to have one just like it, a 56 Chevy. And the car? White. Tell me, why are you asking all these questions? We think there's a good chance your dog wasn't lost, Miss Van Meter. You don't mean that man stole him? Yes, ma'am, it's a possibility. Well, I never would have thought that. Tell me, would his license number help? If you have it, yes, ma'am. Well, only the letters. It was funny, I noticed. But you see, I'm a member of the Afghan Hound Association, and when he drove off, I just happened to catch it. The letters on his license plate were A-H-A. Afghan Hound Association. Can you remember anything else about the car? No, that's all. I'm sure you'll find this all very innocent, Sergeant. He was such a nice young man. He wouldn't have stolen Zardy. Well, we're just checking, ma'am. We want to be sure. I understand. Is there anything else I can tell you? No, ma'am, that should do it for now. We would like to take a look at your car before we leave. Oh, I'm afraid that's not possible. Oh, why is that, ma'am? The garage man picked it up this morning. Oh, is that so? Yes, the door lock on the driver's side. It got broken somehow. One thirty p.m., we returned to Parker Center. Bill began making a telephone follow-up with the remaining lost dog owners while I arranged to have the partial license number run through the department's automated field interview card computer system. 2.40 p.m., I returned to the office after having provided Officer John DeCoopcrank the necessary descriptors for the automated FI card computer run. You get any info on that license? No, not yet. They're running it now. What's that you got there? What, these? Oh, just the reports we've been taking that list from the animal shelter. I've already called most of the owners. No, I mean underneath. Underneath? Yeah, that. Oh, that? Yeah, that. Well, it's a book, Joe. I can see that. You have to know it's a book about dogs. I figured that brush up a little might help on this case. Yeah, from your conversations this morning, I'd say you could use it. Oh, I don't know. You just try me. I'll pick any dog at random, cover the breed name, and call it. That is a Norwegian foxhound. Nope, you're wrong. Okay, smart guy. What do you think it is? A borzoi, once called a Russian wolfhound. You're right. Certainly I am. All right, what's this one? It's a Briard. This? Commodore. This? That's the Affenpincher, or the monkey dog. 
Son of a gun, that's right. How do you do it, Joe? You never owned a dog in your whole life. Where'd you get that book? Police library, why? Well, now, didn't you think it's strange, a book on dogs in our library? Oh, I don't know. I called, they had it, I picked it up. Uh -huh. Take a look at the inside cover there. Now, what do you see? Nothing unusual, just the checkout card. Has anyone that you know or that you've heard of ever checked that book out? Sergeant Joe Friday, April 19th. I brushed up once, too. In fact, I had the library requisition that book. Why? What reason did you have to study up on dogs? Remember that case we worked last year? Oh, well, that's it. The trained dog snatching ladies' purses. Now you're on the beam, pal. I just figured I should know something about dogs if I was working a case involving them. Like I'm doing now. Like you're doing now, finally. What'd you find out from those dog owners? I got hold of 15 of them. Same story. They advertised, and within a day or so, somebody came up with their dog. And collected a reward. Naturally. I'd say we have two suspects working, though. How do you figure? About half of the people gave the same description the Van Meter woman gave. A short guy driving a white Chevy. The other half described a tall suspect over six feet. Sounds like a Mutt and Jeff team. What kind of rewards are they hauling down? The least was 50. Most of them between one and 200. One guy paid 500. Burglary Auto Friday. Yes, John. Yeah. That's Adam. Henry. Adam. Right. Two suspects. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Right. Thanks, John. Oh, and you can put yourself down for another hit, pal. Yeah. Right, thanks. <coughs> that partial license paid off. Radio car FI'd two suspects last month. It's Harry Jennings, age 20, 5 foot 5, and Carl Barth, 24, 6'2. Martin Jeff. What were the circumstances? Possible car prowlers questioned and released. El Centro Shopping Center? That's it. The FI address on the suspects matched the DMV information. Let's check it out. Before we go, try this one. Let me see that. No, no, not the name. No, no, just let me look at it. Whew, boy, I don't know. You got me on that one, pal. Joe, that is a wire-haired pointing griffin hound, considered to be one of the most common breeds of all time. Shall we go? Griffin Hound was an ancient breed considered to be extinct today. Three ten p.m. We drove to the address listed on the suspect's vehicle registration. The house was a single-family residence located five blocks from the El Centro Shopping Center. The suspect's vehicle was nowhere in sight. Seizure says we can't go in and get them, so I guess we just wait. Not for long. Whatever you guys are selling, I don't want it. Where'd you get the dog, Harry? How do you know my name? We're police officers. Now I ask you a question, Harry. I found the dog if it's any of your business. Why? We have a hunch. Maybe you didn't find it. Well, play your hunch, cop. And if you have any more questions, see my lawyer. Do you have a search warrant? We'll get one. Do that. But for now, bug off, because I know my rights. Then you probably know we can seize evidence within your immediate grasp. Yeah, when there's probable cause for arrest, right? Right, Harry, and you're under arrest. And the charge, suspicion of grand theft. 3.30 p.m., after arranging for a radio car to guard the residence until a search warrant could be obtained, we transported Harry Jennings and the Scotty back to the office. 3.40 p.m., I contacted the Department of Animal Regulation and obtained the name and address of the Scotty's owner through the dog license number. Upon calling, we learned our hunch was right. The owner stated his Scotty was missing from his car at the El Centro Shopping Center sometime during the past two hours. We arranged for a radio car and a latent print man to make a preliminary investigation of the Scotty owner's vehicle. 4.10 p.m. We waited. What are you two guys going to give up? I told you I found this dog walking down the street. Now, you can't prove nothing else. How many dogs have you found like that in the last few months, Harry? A few? I like dogs. Is that a crime? No, but stealing them out of cars and collecting a reward is. Yeah, well, them dogs were lost. They must have jumped out of the cars by accident. More than 20 of them from the same shopping center? So it's a coincidence. That don't prove nothing. Where's your partner, Harry? What are you talking about? I don't have no partner. You suppose he's out picking up more dogs, Harry? You're blowing smoke. There ain't no partner, I tell you. Does the name Carl Barth ring a bell? Never heard of him. Any luck, Charlie? Got a couple good lists from the right window. All right, there's your suspect. Let's see if we've got a case. Now, wait a minute. I got my rights. That's right, you do, Harry, and we're going to protect those rights. You bet. If they're not your prints, you go home until we can build a better case. 
flat impression was taken of the suspect's right hand. Charlie King gave us the results. Is it make, Joe, 10 points? What's 10 points mean? 10 points means we've got a case, Harry. Book him. p.m. While Bill booked Harry Jennings, I arranged for the preparation of an affidavit in support of a search warrant for the premises where the suspects had caged the other animals. A detective team was dispatched to relieve the radio car staked out on the location. Well, Harry's all tucked away. Where's the Scotty? Oh, the owner picked him up a few minutes ago. Hope he keeps him healthy for the court appearance. Well, judging from the emotional reunion, I'd say that dog's gonna be just fine. What do we do about suspect number two, Carl Barth? I'll put a team on the house. If he shows, they'll grab him. And if he doesn't show? Burglary Auto Friday. Yes, sir. How long ago was that? No, you did just fine. We'll be right there. Myron Bentley just got a call. The Clumber Spaniel? Right. Man found his dog, said he was going to take it to him in 30 minutes. Think it's Carl Barth? The guy wanted to know if the reward offer was still good. 5.10 p.m. After arranging for a team of uniformed officers to cover the outside, we briefed Myron Bentley on the methods we wanted to employ in apprehending the suspect. We copied down the serial numbers of the reward money. Well, it's all finished for Duke now. I can't tell you how happy I am to have him coming home. Yes, sir, we understand how you feel. I didn't tell the wife. Wanted to make sure first, you know. But I'm not going to wait till next week, sir. Duke's birthday. Not going to wait. Going to give him his present just as soon as he gets here. Yes. That's Duke. All right, now, Mr. Bentley, remember what we told you to do. Yes, sir. I will. I will. really you. How you been, fella? How you been? He's been just fine. Where'd you ever find him? He was digging in my garbage can. I saw what kind of dog he was, and I figured right off he was lost. So I took good care of him and looked for an ad in the paper. I'll be darned, his collar's gone. Yes, sir. He didn't have one on him when I found him. That's why I waited for an ad. Well, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Uh, uh, Smith. Randy Smith. Well, Mr. Smith, my wife's going to be tickled pink. Yes, sir. I've got to be going. I have a date in about 30 minutes. Oh, I didn't mean to hold you up. Just want to thank you again, Mr. Smith. You did mention a reward in your ad. Oh, that I did, that I did. Darn near skipped my mind. Let's see, that's uh, 60, uh, 150, 200. Is that right? Yes, sir. Well, I better be going. I've got a couple of friends waiting. That's right, you do. Just hold it right hey, there. What is Police it? officers, you're under arrest. My name is Duke, owner Myron Bentley. Recognize this, Mr. Bentley? I sure do. Sack him up. Duke's collar. You were right all the time, Sergeant. Doesn't make any difference who was right, Mr. Bentley. The important thing is you got your dog back. Yes, sir. And believe me, that's all that counts. Come on, Duke. I got something for you. A nice new castle. Happy birthday, boy. Well, come on. Come on. Don't you want to go into your nice new... Well, come on, boy. What's the matter? Don't you like your new house? Oh, come on, Duke. Go into your nice new castle. Huh? Well, no wonder you won't go in. You've got your lead on. Okay to give him one of these? Oh, sure, sure. Say, that's all right, Officer Gaddy. How'd you know to do that? You know quite a bit about dogs. Tell him. December 3rd, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. I didn't. My sister-in-law did. 
Woman's become a health nut. She got a hold of one of those charts to tell you how much you should weigh for how old you are and all. Turns out I'm four and a half pounds over. Never can get these things open. Well, it could be worse. You wouldn't say that if you had to eat yogurt every day for a solid week. There's a candy bar in the drawer there. Forget it. My sister-in-law's staying with us this week when her husband's back east. The minute I walk in that house tonight, I step on a scale. Well, I can't wait till three o'clock. What happens at three o'clock? I get to have an apple. Joe, Bill. Yes, sir. I want you and Bill to take a ride out to Venice. I just talked to Sergeant Porter for you, West L.A. Vice. There's a friend of his out there. Mike B's got a 653 FPC soliciting for murder. The guy's name is Steve Deal. Here's the address. He's got a record, but he's been clean four years now. Porterfield thinks he's leveling. What's that? That's my lunch, Captain. You could lose a few pounds. Yes, sir. Try an apple later if you get hungry. It'll help. to check the possible murder solicitation. Solicitation to commit murder is a violation of Section 653F of the California Penal Code. 1.32 p.m., we arrived at Stephen Deal's address. It was a cheap couple of rooms over a pottery shop. Police officers. Oh, yeah, okay. You the guy's Porterfield, sir? That's right. Friday and Gannon, homicide. Oh, come on in. This is a real wreck. I didn't expect you guys so soon. I'll just straighten it up. Don't bother. Don't bother. Just take a minute. Yeah, that's better, huh? Yeah, it's fine. Isn't that a gas? Some of Myra's work. She runs a pottery shop downstairs. That girl's a real talent. What's it supposed to be? Number 15. Huh? Myra calls it number 15. Okay. You want to tell us what this is about? Yeah, postcards right here. A thousand isn't enough. If you want to make a killing, replace the ad and give a phone number. Weird, huh? Maybe. Might not be anything. I don't know. How'd you happen to get this card, Steve? Well, I was broke, see? I mean, dirty broke. The original, plenty of nothing. Well, I uh, guess you guys know I did time. Yeah, we know. Yeah, I did a year for Grand Theft Auto. I mean, I blew one once. And, well, it happens, right? It happens. How'd you get this card? The parole thing is over. Now I'm free. If I want to go, I can go anywhere. And I had a kind of an offer for a job writing some stuff. What do you write? Poems. Words for greeting cards. I studied how to do it in the joint. I got so sick of those cards people used to send me, I figured I could do better. The card? Yeah. Well, I needed bread and I needed a chunk, so I put this ad in the L.A. Happening. Just said that I was willing to do anything. Repeat. Anything for a thousand bucks. The L.A. Happening. What's that? One of those way out hippie newspapers, you know, comes out once a week full of weird ads and against everything. Especially cops. And this was the answer you got? Yeah, just this morning. What else did you get? Well, I got two offers of marriage. If you ever want to read some nutty letters. And a guy wanted me to take over a franchise deal on some kind of pickle thing. And another guy wanted to take moving pictures of me. Man, that letter was nothing but strange. What was it about this card that made you call Porterfield? I've been clean ever since I got out, Sergeant. I want to stay that way. I'm not about to get involved with a somebody maybe wanting to make a hit. I gotta tell you, it hasn't got much to do with me being a good citizen. It's just got to do with me doing for me. I've known Milt Porterfield since school. He's always been straight with me. So I called him. What did you want the money for? About the only stuff I've sold was some Christmas material to this little company in Denver. They called me and told me if I could get set up there, I could probably sell them some more. I wanted to get there fast, and I didn't want to go poor mouth. Tell me, do you think this card could mean a hit? Who knows? I got the thing, and anyway, there was no return address on it. No nothing. Like I say, it seemed weird, and I thought I'd better let you guys worry about it. All right, we'll take this card along with us and think about it. We'll get back to you. Okay, oh, but Sergeant, uh, the thing just says if I want to make a killing, that could mean like the stock market or something. It could. Sure. But you usually say that to a man who's already got a thousand, don't you? <laughs> we returned to PAB and gave Deal's postcard to Captain Brown. It was 3.05 p.m. All right, maybe we got a 6.53 and maybe we don't. Mailed yesterday from Beverly Hills and no return. It could be anything. Yes, sir. This deal, he make any kind of walk-around money pitch for this? Never mention money. And he's broke? Yes, sir, he is. All right, call Porterfield, see what he thinks. And then let's play out the string. Have Deal place the other ad and you stand by his phone. If he's that broke, is the bill paid? Well, we'll see that it is. Do that. Joe, if we can make an arrest here, I wanted a clean one. If the guy does tumble for the second ad and calls, and we do have a solicitation to commit murder... I want you to make awful sure that you don't solicit him yourself. 
You'll just have to sell him that you're Steve Deal and make him come to you. Yes, sir, I know that. How far do you want me to go? All the way. If somebody wants somebody else knocked off, right away he doesn't worry about the rule book. And we have to. And if we spook him, there's nothing to prevent him soliciting somebody else. Yes, sir. Or maybe doing the job himself. <laughs> Tuesday, March 21st, 11.15 a.m. Deal had placed the second ad in the happening. It would run Friday morning. We had the photo lab make up a driver's license in Deal's name, only with my picture and signature. The same was done for all forms of ID that Deal would normally carry. Friday, March 24th, 9.05 a.m. The happening would be on the stands any minute. We took up a watch on Steve Deal's telephone. That's right. I placed the ad. Same as last week. Oh? Did you get a letter from a girl named Beverly? Yes, yes, I did. I got it. Well, no. No, that wouldn't work out. No, I wouldn't be interested. Yes, I am married. No, no, I wouldn't be interested, lady. Yes, ma'am. Oh, what's the matter, Joe? You're not married, and a thousand bucks is a thousand bucks. Well, you are married. Suppose somebody offered you a thousand bucks to get a divorce, would you take it? Joe, that's a terrible question to ask any married man. I guess the paper's out now. Yeah, I guess. What's going to happen when this guy calls? If I can sell him that I'm you and I need money, he'll probably arrange to meet me someplace. Uh, what if he doesn't buy it? Then we're out of luck. Somebody could get killed. Maybe. Say you do sell him your me. Then you meet him, and as soon as he asks you to kill somebody, you bust him, right? Wrong. He's just asking me isn't enough. It's just his word against mine that's not admissible. He's got to give me some piece of hard evidence so I can prove that he asked me. And you got to con him into it. Can't do that either. Huh? In the law, they call that entrapment. The guy's got to solicit Joe. If Joe solicits him, his attorney will say that Joe trapped him. They'll throw it right out of court. So, you just play it by ear? Nope, with a book. Hello? Yeah? Yeah, that was me. Are you the one that sent the card? I hope you're not putting me on, mister. That extra ad cost me two bucks. Yeah, sure, I want it back. I don't have two bucks lying around all the time. What difference does it make what I need the money for? I need it. Why should I tell you that? Okay, okay. My name's Steve Deal, and I write words for greeting cards. Mister, if you'd read anything I'd written, I wouldn't need the thousand bucks. Yeah, that's what I said in the ad, anything. Look, I'm not asking any questions. It doesn't matter what you want done for the money, anything. Yeah, all right, I'll meet you. I got a Ford wagon, a 60. All right, yeah, I know where that is. Okay. All right, what? No, the license number on the wagon is JUO 664. 664. All right, 9 o'clock. I'll be there. Nine o'clock tonight, exactly two and six tenths miles up Beverly Glen from sunset. I'm supposed to park the wagon there, sit in it, and wait for 20 minutes. Then I'm to drive on to Mulholland, turn left, and go seven tenths of a mile. There's a dirt shoulder there off to the right. I pull over and park. Not bad. Not bad. It means the guy can check on you and make sure nobody's following. That's smart. No, that's not smart. It's just kind of cute. How do you mean? If he was smart, he wouldn't need anybody killed in the first place. decided that Steve Deal would visit a friend of his at Redondo Beach. He agreed to let us use his apartment until the case was concluded. 8.59 p.m. I followed the instructions and drove Deal Station Wagon up Beverly Glen to a point two and six tenths miles above sunset. I parked and waited. 9.20 p.m. I started the wagon and moved out for the spot off Mulholland. Two undercover police cars were on a rolling stakeout in the area, and Bill had the meeting place under surveillance. 9.37 p.m. I'd been waiting over 12 minutes. 
Why do you need the money? My definition of anything is just what the word says, anything. Why I need the money is my business. I'm not asking you any questions. You got some identification? Yeah. Here. Maybe we can talk some business. Then let's talk it. Now, you said there was more than a thousand in it. If I decide you're the man for the job, there is. I'd want you to steal something for me. Well, I didn't figure it was going to be legal. Something that belongs to my wife. A locket. A locket? What's it worth? About 200. Grand? Dollars. You're going to pay me a thousand bucks or more just to steal a locket worth 200? That's right. Except I wouldn't want any witnesses. You wouldn't? No. If there were any witnesses, we couldn't do any business. You always talk in circles, fella. Why don't you tell me what you really want? I told you. I want a locket taken. Yeah. But since I wouldn't want any witnesses, and since she wears it constantly, she'd have to be killed. Well, you finally said the words, didn't you? Now what happens? Now we got something to talk about. You want somebody killed, it'll cost you five. Two. Four. Three. Three. My wife is an unusual one. She's a predictable alcoholic. She was brought up to believe that no decent person drinks before five in the afternoon. She doesn't. But by six, she's loaded every night of her life. I don't want her dead so much for the fact that she's drunk after five as I do that she's sober before it. That's my problem. When you hit her, I'd like it to hurt. But there's no sense taking that chance. All right, how are you going to work it? I want you to walk into the house and hit my wife over the head with a length of galvanized iron pipe. Hit her as many times as you like. Just make sure you hit her hard and that the job is done. She'll be passed out on the couch in the study. She always is. She won't hear you come in. I can make sure of that with a little pure alcohol in her scotch. You're going to give me a key to the place? You won't need a key. I'll leave the front door open for you. You walk in, get it done, then go to the desk in the study. There'll be a thousand in cash taped under the middle drawer. You take that and the locket from my wife's neck, and you meet me back up here at a time I'll give you later, and you get your other two thousand. Look, I got a case to the place. At least give me the address. It's going to take me until Sunday to set my alibi. If I decide to use you, I will give you the address then. All right. If you decide... We got a contract. No. We've got an understanding. Yeah. I'll let you know on Sunday if we've got a contract. Ten thirteen PM, the suspect got into his car and drove off. He had given me nothing to build a case with. This number into DMV. There's no one on it. Nothing back from records yet. I'll give you odds it's not his car. No bet. You think he's leveling? He wants his wife dead, Bill. Now he's either going to have me do it or he's going to get somebody else to do it. Yeah. Or he might even do it himself. Saturday, March 25th, 8.07 a.m. The undercover police cars on Rolling Stakeout had tailed the suspect down to Sunset, but they had lost him when he had abandoned the car in Hollywood. Riley Maxwell of Leighton Prince had gone over the car. It was clean. DMV records in Sacramento had run it down as belonging to a Mrs. Dorothy Cayley at an address on Tula Rosa. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. Now, you be sure and lock your car after this, will you? Thanks again. Mrs. Cayley had her bridge club in last night. She didn't even know the thing had been stolen. Didn't lock it when she parked it last night, huh? No, she didn't. Keys on the sun visor. Glove compartment. Why didn't she put a sign on it? How about some coffee, Joe? I'll be glad to run up and get you a cup. No, thanks. Relax. Don't let it get to you. Someplace out in the city, there's a man making up his mind whether or not to use me to murder his wife, and I don't like it. Joe, there's nothing we can do about it till he calls again. I don't know. Maybe I just should have pulled him in last night. You'd have blown the case. Yeah, but maybe it might have scared him off. Sunday, March 26th, 8 a.m. Bill and I took up a telephone watch in Steve Deal's apartment. There had been no way to get a make on the suspect. The only thing we could do now was wait for him to call. 10.27 p.m. 14 hours went by. The telephone had not rung. One thing I gotta do. Yeah, what's that? If that's called number 15, sometime I gotta go and find out what number 16 looks like. Yeah. You know, if this character does call, he's gonna try and have some cute setup where we can't follow him. 
The only chance we got to nail them is for you to go all the way with them. That could add up to anything. Well, we don't have much choice, do we? No, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I still want that 3,000. But when? Where? Yeah, anything you say. Said I should go out and just start driving. Where to? Said I'd find out. Think we ought to try a loose tail on you? He might be trying that himself. 10.48 p.m. Deal station wagon was parked in front of the apartment. I didn't know where or how the suspect would try and make contact. Page 281 of the Western Directory phone book had been torn out and left on the front seat of the car. The address of Jason Lum, 10788 Bellagio Road, Bel Air, had been circled. 11.17 p.m. I arrived at 10788 Bellagio. Again, you follow instructions very well. I still need the dough. Is this it? No, this was just a checkout. Go back to your place and wait. I'll call you. You'll call me when? You know, the minute the phone rings. Eleven twenty-five p.m. I return to Deal's apartment. Another false alarm? Yeah. Well, we got two undercover units in the area now. They got your wagon staked out. Anybody goes near it, they'll tell them. Okay. You think you'll try the same thing again? It's a big phone book. One twenty-two a.m. Monday, March twenty-seven. The suspect had called again. Another page of the phone book had been dropped in the station wagon. This time, the address was in West Los Angeles. It was another false alarm. 2.15 a.m., I returned to Deal's apartment for the second time. Right, thanks. We got him, Joe. The tail made him this time. Name's Forrester, Harvey L., 10671 Shalon Road, Bel Air. Anything on him? No, he's clean. Well, what do we got, then? A name and an address. Yeah. All we need now is a case to go with it. 3.10 a.m., the suspect, whom we now knew to be Harvey Forrester, called again, and I was given an address in Inglewood. This time I knew it was the wrong address. Monday, March 27th, there was no word at all from Forrester during the daylight hours. 10.12 p.m., Forrester called. This time I was given instructions. I was told to go to the address I'd find in the station wagon and wait for 15 minutes. If I didn't hear from him, I was to enter the house and get the job done. Then I was to meet him at the place off Mulholland and receive the rest of the money. The address he circled was his own. Harvey Forrester, 10671 Shallon Road, Bel Air. I called Bill on the walkie-talkie and filled him in. I drove out to Bel Air. I was two blocks from Forrester's address on Shallon Road. It was 10.32 p.m. Joe, you better hold it up. What's going on? Forrester isn't out trying to establish an alibi. He's inside that house right now. You can figure the rest. I kill the wife, he kills me. Looks that way, doesn't it? Yeah, the only trouble is it doesn't change anything. We still don't have anything admissible against him. Well, Joe, maybe the woman's already dead. What's to stop him from trying to kill you the minute you open the door? He's afraid to kill his wife. If he wasn't, she'd have been dead before this. Now, I think he has to have somebody else do the job for him. Who are you trying to convince, me or you? p.m. I drove the remaining two blocks to the Forrester house, parked and waited for 15 minutes. There was no sign of the suspect. 10.52 p.m. I left the wagon and started for the house. By now, Bill and the other three officers working the stakeout would have had enough time to get into position. Bill and I had agreed that they would give me three minutes inside to smoke Forrester out before moving in to back me up. Forrester had to be somewhere close. I couldn't see him. supposed to be out getting 
yourself an alibi. True. But instead, I'm about to shoot a burglar with a thousand dollars of my money in his pocket. I don't need an alibi. Sorry, Deal. Your mistake. No, Forrester, you made the mistake. I'm a police officer, and there are four more right outside. Now, you be a good boy, and you walk over there and put that gun on that desk. You've got nothing on me? Nothing at all. Don't we? Here's the thousand, under the drawer, like he said. I'll get a photog out here, Joe. Drunk? Yeah. I'll call an ambulance. Right. How'd you find me, anyway? How did you know who I was? You fell in love with the phone book. The second time you tried that page bit, you were followed. <sighs> Lousy, sloppy drunk. Don't knock her, Forrester. She had a good reason to drink. And what's that? Being married to you. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On May 29th, trial was held in Department 186, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was found guilty of soliciting the commission of a murder, an offense which is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail not longer than one year, or in the state prison not longer than...